now is kind of where are we now? But for folks who are new, right, we've been throwing out EDGE a lot. So I say it's EDGE without an E, stands for Enterprise Data Governance. And it is our tool that if you look at this diagram that, that Carlos talked about yesterday, it's this upper layer, the semantic layer, um, that is going to help us describe. I had to jump because that was. Which is mean. I could have just here. <laughs> but it's where we're going to be collecting and describing our data, so that it's not only understandable by our community, because while. Um, Travis, right, is very familiar with fuel sample data and he can talk about it and he knows what he's talking about. Somebody not familiar with fuels isn't going to know what he means, much less somebody outside of fire or another system. And so by having edge and defining what our data means, it makes it way more accessible to not only our community, but external parties and systems. So edge, edge lives in that, that layer over the entire IDME effort. And that's where the NWCG glossary lives. That's where our data standards are living. Uh, that's where these reference data sets, so we're talking about organizations, frequencies, other things that are identified throughout the community that <coughs> um, need to be governed and reusable will live in, in edge. So that's a, like in a nutshell what it is. Since the last summit at the... Uh, Spring Summit in April, we were still on version 7.1. We're now on version 7.6. It took us kind of a while to get there, but with that, we got some enhanced capabilities and functionalities, which from a from a general user's perspective don't really mean much, but for somebody for somebody who's in there working, um, it's enhanced how how I get to work in there. And the, the interface is much more streamlined and it they gave us some new API capabilities and some additional things that we're going to continue to take advantage of. Uh, within the last week, Don helped us connect to S3 buckets. So Edge has the ability to you know, connect to an S3 bucket out there so that we can either import data into those and then bring them out into Edge or just have a collection in Edge connected to them and then therefore save some attachments. So for example, last week, the architecture review board you know they've submitted some memos and right now who knows where they live well we want to develop a catalog in edge and drop those actual memos into an s3 bucket connected to their metadata item in edge so we don't have to be like where was that where's that email go search for them we'll actually be able to have them accessible <laughs> for us to reference um, we now have three environments so at the we were pretty much just working in a production environment, but we now have a staging and a dev, which will help one because not only is Wildland Fire using Edge, but DOI as a whole has been invited to use our instance of Edge. And so we have a multiple bureaus who are getting in and trying to, to use it, as well as some folks from Chris's office and the Forest Service. And now that we have free environments, it'll kind of be easier to introduce new people to its functionality, let them test it, figure it out, and then gradually move through the environments to do things. Recently, this effort was started a while ago, but folks from Brad's office gave me uh, files of database schemas for the FAMIAM applications, and we were waiting to be upgraded to the new version to get them into Edge. So they are now in Edge, and what that is providing for us is visibility on the schema, which will eventually tie to data standards and forms or data sets so that we can understand what our data landscape looks like and how when one change in one place affects something somewhere else. And that will also feed up into an overall DOI effort of, of a data inventory. So we're taking little steps to work towards that. But I was excited to finally get them in there and be able to see the schemas, so the tables and the columns and what they mean and you know if you few other additional pieces of information describing what the data is within those. Uh, yes, Brad. <laughs> so with the schemas, like the ones that I provided to you, uh -huh. um, if there's changes to a schema, do you need a new export? Or if it's say just two new fields, can you go into Edge and just add them? Yes, yeah. And that would probably be the easiest way is to just, just add them that edge. small. Yeah, something we can talk about, but yeah, that would be easy 
have to add. What was the question? I'm sorry. He said, so, right, I brought in the whole uh, database schema from a file, but if since then one or two fields have changed, does it make more sense to run the file again and have me reload it or just hand enter those two fields? Right. And it wouldn't be much work to add the two fields, probably less than it would be to pull the file again. And then, yeah, combine and. Yeah. <laughs> And then we can also. But we do it. need to talk about that process so that, you know, as because database schemas or new columns are added all the time for different work. For different purposes, so. And one thing we. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Well, one question was, does Edge have the capability to connect directly to your database and basically scan or harvest that, that metadata from the data so that as it changes? You can you know, keep straight and, and do it stuff out. Yes, it does. We haven't taken advantage of that from a fire perspective, but the Office of Natural Resources and Revenue, who is using Edge, is using a JDBC connection to their or well, no, Snowflake. to their Snowflake to Snowflake to scan and all of that. They've been successful. Yes. middle there's a, a security group we needed to go through security group to make sure they let yeah. this that uh, connect happen yeah yeah at, the, at the any time at the time this is a different goes from place to place yeah. Yeah, that's good. another Something that I was asked to do, so NWCG training is but we're using Edge to document the, document the incident position descriptions because the statements for position descriptions are reusable. And I watched this code on a website and they can't compare across positions. So when one changes, um, they asked us if they could compare statements. So this statement is being used, but are there like statements for it? And we got Chalkboard and helped to write some quick code to be able to do that. So um, that was exciting. And then another change. So previously with Explorer, which is our read only version of Edge, right? we have our editor version where we're governing the data and then we can choose which pieces of that information are published to a more public version, which you call Explorer. And previously um, it looks like there was no authentication on it. It was just, but it was happening in the background of a form. So it was an anonymous username and password. Everybody would go in and yeah it would just be pretty straightforward recently we've now switched over to using login.gov for explorer so the public will still be able to access it but they'll have to create a login.gov account um, several advantages to this is one it adheres to some security requirements the second is that when it was a generic user login uh, you couldn't save your searches or kind of your views now if everybody is comes in and they have kind of their named account, they will be able to rewrite their searches and save things, which was something some folks were asking for. So initially it was like, ooh, ah, but it's it will still, our data will still be open and available. Um, and it will just allow, I think, for some more flexibility by individual users for how they, they see the data. Question. Yes. So if you have an edit role, I mean, you can edit everything. No, no. So Edge, because it is a governance tool, it is driven off of governance roles and business and data subject areas. And it can be as broad as you can edit anything in Wildland Fire, or it can be uh, as specific as you can only edit this one glossary term. That's all you're allowed to edit. So it can be broad or incredibly narrow. And so as we get additional stewards in managing data, it will be very focused. So for example, the frequency stewards, right? We're going to have it so that we have a frequency steward group and then but within that frequency steward group, they're only able to edit those frequencies that they are responsible for. Right. They can see everything. And then another example would be the position naming board, right? They can get into the editor of Edge, see all wildland fire data, but they are only able to edit the data within the position codes and titles collection. And then another kind of another, I guess, feature is that Edge allows for workflows, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, and 
anybody in the editor version could kick off a workflow and make suggestions for edits, but it has to go through a governance process for that to actually be committed as that's approved piece of data. Well, that's good. Um, when Edge was initially launched, we were under data inventory.doi.gov. Right? So once again, this is at the DOI level, not the wildland fire level. And the data inventory from the department level uh, describes both a project of this overall data inventory that the department is working on and an individual application that they have had developed to support the data inventory effort. And Edge was kind of tagged, tagged on to that. Uh, since then, we've decided to kind of decouple the two. One, to explain that there is a difference between Edge and this other system and try to get clarity between how all three work together. So we're just waiting on the security certificates to switch Edge over to datagovernance.doi.gov as its, its namespace. And then I didn't list everything I'm working on because depending on the day, I have multiple <laughs> projects going on at Edge, but of significant uh, the data element and geospatial la data layer standards continue to be something I've worked towards refining to make it usable, right? So leading up to EDGE, data standards and the glossary were on the website and managed in PDF documents. Couldn't, when something changed, you couldn't trace it through, right? That's what brought up one of our action items. So if a data element changes, that's an attribute in a geospatial data layer, how do we navigate and make sure everybody knows what's happening. So I've slowly been trying to figure out how to best model and put that together with an edge to make it work for, for what we need. Uh, one thing that edge has introduced to us is this idea of a business term. Because lots of our data elements or geospatial layer attributes are describing a business concept, something that we can talk about, but it represents a piece of data and uh, so I guess I just really want to just make you aware of this term. If you hear me throw out business term, a business term in the context of edge is something we use that can represent data and therefore we might know additional pieces of information about it, like business rules or uh, data value rules. So whether it's a string or an integer and you know, min max seals, kind of some more of the technical part that not all the business cares about, but is important to know when we're asking technical folks to implement something about a business concept. And then APIs. So I'm so thankful that uh, Don is here because before like, Andrew left us and we hadn't been able to get very far and then I was like, I can't do this. I mean, I, I want to learn how to do it, but then if, if I learned how to do everything, nothing would get done. <laughs> so, um, we're moving forward on figuring out the edge APIs. And part of that too was, was getting up to 7.6, which had additional capabilities for APIs, which is made really large. And Honor, Office of Natural Resources and Revenue, right now is kind of parting the waters a little bit, trying to navigate some of those, all well, the security things that Lynn was talking about, and then just us understanding how and who we're gonna issue credentials and things like that. Anything else to add? No. Other than all of our new environments and the certificates, we, we've gone through a lot of the different login options and just so that because we knew the API portion was something that we had to be able to do. And so, um, but we also wanted to continue with login.gov as, as a way for just us internally, as well as all of our state and local partners, that, that's an easy way to, to get it in. Um, so. We, we have a lot of that figured out now, just kind of waiting on those certificates yet again. You know, I think we've now given out three different URLs for for edge from, you know, the path from mm -hmm. the spring summit to now and a new one will be coming. And hopefully we will, you know. At that point be in production and and that will be that. Will be. So GIS task order will go away. Correct. That one is just like a temporary one that the, the contractor had that they could use. Mm -hmm. So, yep. But yes. but all of that data that that is production right now. The namespace is just going to change. Yeah. So I know you can't list them all because you, you're doing so much. My question is around the next 
data set that we've been talking about for the learning management systems and the courses mm -hmm. and the courses from each system and and what we can do to help support that effort to get us what we need. I was going to say you, but it's really all of us what we need to get them in there. Um, do you want me to hold off? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'll, I'll take that one. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> so, um, so I think what I'm going to do is pivot a little bit. We've been working primarily with the NWCG training group. I'm going to pivot to the in, to the training development committee and start having some conversations with them because what I want to do is make sure that we're using a good governance process and oversight for like figuring out are there standards that we need to put in place? Are there, you know, that we have some guidance. And so I so I haven't met with um, the chairs of that group yet. Uh, and so I, I think until I meet with them and kind of start figuring out where they're at and where their mindset is, because they're they are looking at I mean, there, there's a lot of focus on the wildland fire learning portal, but we know that there are other learning systems as well as and the agencies sure and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, so, so let me work with them and then. Do, do they have FEMA state representation? Uh, I think that on that group there is, a, there's a, it's actually. Can you invite Keith and maybe me? Why not? I've got a yeah, he's got nothing to do. No, you have nothing to do. <laughs> just <laughs> twiddling your thumbs over there. Just home twiddling your thumbs all the time. I, I just think that it's, yeah, I mean, the easy ones are like the CG one, right? I say easy, that's probably that, that is the happier path. Yeah. But, um, and the IAT, um, but I think there's this right. massive piece that we want to make um, sure it doesn't see, get federalized. There is, yeah. oh. Glenn Holmgren is the, the National Association of State Foresters, and Stephen Patterson, and there's a U.S. Fire Administration, there's an I chief. so that's all of the bureaus and Forest Service. So, so that's so a lot. Quickly, quickly chat offline. Yeah. You can chat offline, but just be mindful that there are some dependencies on that. Okay. Yeah. I think in, there's some stuff we need to figure out, like, organizationally and governance wise and that kind of stuff before we get too far with Gabriella modeling some of that stuff. Um, and part of the conversation that um, I'm being asked to participate in, is I would define as an authoritative data source discussion and talking about where, where we really want to manage data, whether it's in the learning management system or an edge, and then how we move it back and forth between them because in the end, we want that data in Edge because we can link it to all these other things, right? But if that's, if it's from a user perspective, it's better to, for them to update stuff in the learning management system. I mean, we don't really care. No. We just want to be able to get it into Edge. So in one place that we can all access it. Yeah, so so I think I think that's probably going to be some conversation we'll be having this fall. Okay. I need a bit of urgency. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, one other question for Rochelle, and that is, uh, what are the plans for governance as far as EGG and IDME? Where are you going? Are, are there plans to have a board that you'll have, or are there plans to take care of it internally within, um, within the group that works on this? Or So, DOI has a governance board for EDGE at that level. When we talk about our data, this the data summits, the data and the data management committee are the primary means for getting information about that. And you know, I at one point in time we talked about having a, standing up a separate data governance board. And leadership at that time asked me not to create another group that the same people would have to participate on, but somehow figure out how to. <laughs> use existing uh, groups and uh, and manage it that way. And so, uh, but I continue this way every single data summit. I keep saying we need to talk about data governance or governance for IDME because it's big. And I think we will have to have a separate group for that. Um, right now it's going to kind of be the data management committee and the data management program as we get things started. But I think there will have to be a separate group that um, somehow is coordinated between the DMC and 
the program board and you know I, 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 I there will have to be some additional thank you yeah or we'll let Cole do it all he can decide blue no red And this is a really incomplete list. As you just heard, we have a few things. We have frequencies and organizations, but things that haven't been mentioned um, are connecting database schemas to standards. NWCG website is in the process of being updated, right? The goal when that, as that is updated is to be able to pull the glossary and standards from EDGE and populate the website. Right now we're temporarily directing people to EDGE, but the idea is the data is going to populate the website. If they want to know additional details, it could take them to EDGE. And then we have like this even larger effort that we're going to be planning out uh, with Lynn and, and DOI and how everything we're doing at the, the program level is going to trickle up or trickle down. No, fil filter up, <laughs> you know, um, and how we're eventually going to tie the two together so that from a department level, as they want to get visibility on things that we're doing, um, we can make connections and take advantage of the fact that EDGE is at its heart a semantic knowledge graph and um, is built on relationships. And so you're able to traverse from way over here to here, even if you didn't know there was no connection at all. Um, yes, go ahead. <laughs> So the, uh, I just almost finished up. The, it's called a data categorization. Very much is needed to identify CUI sensitive data elements at the table column level. Okay. So the uh, the pilot did with the uh, honor and the Bessie. Okay, don't ask me to spell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's there in the oil and gas business. One is the department office, one's uh, one of our bureau, right? So EDL, database schema and the tables and the, the whole thing into. And the JDBC live connection is a preferred way, but uh, have to go through a whole lot of security steps. Okay, hold on there. And then so with EDL in, and then the um, tables uh, structure relationship are captured in the edge um, as a data asset and then the um, um, then the business grocery you know so, so so the table gibberish table name translated into the english name the english name had a definition as a business term and the some terms are more like a uh, used across the uh, Enterprise will become an enterprise business grocery. And then the um, on the other side, NERA's CUI categorization and the CUI policy requirements and plus mission side of uh, requirements. Something are proprietary for their business. Something says uh, if the uh, will is uh, over 1,000 feet, they become sensitive, you know. so. Don't quote me on that, that's just an example. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, um, so these are the policy requirement, business requirement, trade you know, requirement, uh, put it together, captured also in edge. And then this magical business term uh, uh, from in the middle connects the policy requirement and the table um, names. And the, so in the edge then, at a business, then this business term, whatever used, that will ever linked to that table column will be marked CUI per this term. Okay, so this whole thing. Then we do this for uh, 40 major investment in DOI. So Wild and Fire has one or two systems, and we're going to do an um, investment system. One investment can have a multiple system. One system has at least one database. Now we're doing the um, relational database side, not the unstructured data yet. And then, so this is the connection on the, you know, the, the same level, right? And then this can answer the policy question for if this data set to support that policy decision or meet that policy requirement, that will help us when O&B and GAO do the data calls. Yeah, so 
that's um that's the pilot we just uh, almost finished. Almost finished. Yeah. How long did it take you to do that? Oh well, <laughs> I started this project in May or June because. Because there's just three sides to uh, prepare, right? Yeah. One's on the mission side, business program side. You needed to get your CUI people, your system owner, your database people, and your privacy people to figure out these business rules. And then the uh, on the edge side, there's a lot of preparation to do, like reference mark, reference mm -hmm. data, right? And then uh, uh, get the investment in, get the you know security side of data in. And then, then the when the top quadrants help, they build this uh, flow. So how does this go from policy requirement to connect to the table column? Mm -hmm. It's beautiful events. I'm really excited. So, but it takes time to build things in Edge as reference as the framework, and it takes time for bureau to get the, their documents together. I guess so. Honor on their side, so they're very well prepared, and so their data dictionary coming in, you know, and then we just have to figure out what's the best way to to map, to connect, and to mock the CUI sensitive. Yeah. So, so you end up using the DLL for yeah. now? And yeah, for now. For now. Yeah. And then, the, yes, for now it's the DLL. And a lot of uh, um, Reference model, reference data we build uh, hopefully can be API'd out of Edge and put in somewhere that downstream system and user can use. And uh, um, for me, what I learned of this is really important is that, so the Edge is an asset based tool, right? So every asset coming in, we have to find the a owner, a stewardship to, to follow it, mm -hmm. right? Can call get the LS <laughs> what I do with this code. <laughs> right? So so who, we need to find that every uh, we need to give every asset collection a a owner. Somebody watches it, updates it, and then makes sure it it expands, it shrink, it been modified. There's somebody literally watching it happen. So that's really important. So I the, the, the real project will start in October. We'll have a, a year to do 40 investments in the wow. OI. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know for sure. <laughs> but I feel like the process and the structure in Edge is is set up. So would you have one person overseeing the collection and then have some people in each, like in, the, in charge of each investment? Within that collection, or are you having one person on receiving the collection? Um, you mean the pilot? Or the well, I mean, I guess in the future, like, because yeah. I know they're managing this stuff, keeping up to date is kind of keeping up to date. Then. Right, so you said someone's going to be literally watching the collection itself or yeah. the individual investments yeah. within it. So, um, not from everything once they get it into Edge is uh, some kind of asset collection, right? Mm -hmm. So, Edge has this governance process. They can you can build a flow so secure is that then this in the middle there's a storeship for that and this person it can be multiple person it can be a group of people you know it depends on the bureau or organization's way to managing their data asset but I feel like we need to separate data management and the data governance mm -hmm. it otherwise we might just, you know, um, don't even aware of, but they say, yeah, this is the I'm not doing the management work. Uh, uh, no, it's not ideal. But but, but the, all the data management process and the way it's conducted needed to be standardized and needed to be repeatable. And then the governance decide is this way keep going or we need to modify this you know so that will help us but in the edge yes it can be one person watch all like a Gabriella <laughs> or we can sign the helicopter to helicopter people yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you thanks Lynn I just wanted to show you two things that I had highlighted earlier, and one, Rochelle mentioned this yesterday, but one term with multiple definitions. I mean, 
in the NWCP glossary. And previously, we would have seen one term and then four definitions associated with it. But now what we are able to do is I have four buildups and then ones related to fire danger, fire management, fire spread and weather. And so just it's allowing us to kind of see, see our terms and things in a, in a different way, kind of blow them apart and make it easier to refine what I'm specifically looking up, looking at the, the definition for buildup as it relates to fire danger. And then I can see what that means. So I'm excited about that and I've probably I've talked about it before, but Rochelle had brought it up yesterday, so I wanted to show you it. It's, and then it's like it's a qualifier. It's qualifying yes. that term. Yes. And the business knowledge blueprint yeah. brings it out, right? Yeah. Like if build up can't be a different term, then add the qualifier. So yeah. 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 It's it's really fun how that is tying into where we're going. Yeah, I think they call it categorization or something like that. But, but yeah, it's basically this is we're, we're qualifying this term in this context. So this this is the one that you're gonna want if you're playing in that world. Yes. And then the other, because I was excited about it, related to the incident position description. So I mentioned it and I picked this statement and then I ran the, the Sparkle query. And Sparkle, it's funny, it stands for Sparkle query language. So the S-P-A-R doesn't mean anything, but and just, you know. Um, so we, we wrote that and then after looking at the statement, it gave me seven statements that are similar and it has kind of this map, a match percentage. And so what it was doing was it was looking at the statement and then comparing all other statements based on you know the word and punctuation and gave me a, a percent match. And so now NWCG can go through and kind of look at them and decide, oh, these really should be combined and this one should go away. Uh, and then we can adjust over time, like if they want it to be a different match percent. Uh, like maybe we we only look at those that are an 85% match for right now the setting is at 50% or above. Um, but I was excited about that functionality since they asked for it and we were able to, to give them something for it. So with that, I'm done unless there are any questions and Chris just walked out the door. Yeah, he was overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> I tried not to take up too much time so he has more. But uh, yeah, any questions? So yeah, Jill, that, that's one for your acronym, SPARKLE. I think I've got that so, acronym. SPARKLE protocol and RDF query language. RDF query language. No, yeah, it's a self, it's SPARKLE protocol and RDF query language. Oh, so they do actually stand for something. Yes, but it still has SPARKLE in the beginning, which doesn't count. That's like using the term in the definition of the term. Do you think there's a rule about that? <laughs> At least in high school. <laughs> okay, Jill, you want to share what's going yeah. on with the website? Are you waiting for Dawn to do something? Yep. Yes. Okay. Oh. Yes, <laughs> Okay, uh, at the last summit, we talked briefly about uh, a website that was coming online uh, and we have been creating it. It's obviously not done, but it's it's in a perpetual state of being updated. So uh, the WFAIP uh, website, which this one is, uh, we have added the newest card down in the lower right hand corner, data management and with it. And if you go into that particular card, you'll notice that there are several options under here, uh, one of which is the DMO or data management office. Uh, WIFIT has its own link within this. Irwin has its own link, um, IDME. So this is where we're going to be finding more and more information about the development of the uh, interagency data management environment. We have data sources. Uh, Don, if you'd actually go into data sources, that would be great. So these are going to be, uh, this is something that I guess is something I would use more, more often than maybe some of the other cards. Everybody's going to have their own particular use depending on what they do and, and what's important to them. 
Uh, but as a GIS person and person working with the U.S. Forest Service GIS community, these are things that I will be looking for. Uh, basic data sets that are often used within the GI within GIS or within work pertaining to GIS and mapping. So these are some of the major data sets that get used. Uh, in, we are not holding the data sets on this website. We are merely pointing to their origination uh, sources, so which is kind of nice. So we can update these as needed. But these are going to be some of your primary data sets or sources from which you're going to find your primary data that you might be utilizing within mapping type work. So if you click back on home for me up at the top, perfect. Back here, um, excuse me, the back page would work the same way. Um, we also have uh, several other options under here which are being built out but may not be at their fullest potential just yet. So more to come. We'd like you to check back early and often. Uh, bookmark this site for yourselves uh, just so that you will have, have it in your set of bookmarks and can share it with those of you that you do work with. Uh, references, links, and help desk. This is all where folks are going to be coming to get help or where they're looking for particular documents. Uh, we also have, um, there will obviously at the top is a link to the acronym list. And as we get more and more information, we'll be throwing these up here. If, as you guys are looking through these, you see things that are missing, maybe we've overlooked something. Maybe, you know, I got going too well or going too fast, or maybe my, uh, my focus is in a different area than what yours is. Please don't hesitate to contact one of us on the group and it will trickle back to me and I can help get this updated or whoever might be taking this one over in the future will also have that option. So if you'll go back, perfect. Uh, training conferences and meetings. If you are looking, for example, for this particular meeting, what's happening with it, what came about as a result of it, this would be a location that you would come to. We would have the agenda hooked up in here. We would have any notes that were taken. We get put here so that you could always come back and take a look. And we do plan to have, at least at this point in time, we do tend to have or plan to have um, all the data summits up there so that people can look back and say, hey, you know, we started on this one way back when. And maybe it didn't, maybe it dropped off the plate. Maybe it needs to be revisited. But this will be a way that, uh, you know, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. So if you see something that's up here and has not been dealt with, don't hesitate to raise your hand and say, hey, what happened, what happened with this topic? Did we move in a different direction? Did we change my, uh, you know, change paths? It's a question worth ask, asking. Um, and then you go ahead and go back. And uh, data standards for now, I believe the data standards will be linking to the NWCG website. And Gabrielle, I'm looking over at you. Is that correct? That's our plan. Okay. Um, it may not be hooked up just yet, but it is coming soon. So. Anyway, uh, this is just a rough idea. If again you see anything that is missing or that you would like to see up here and available, this is, website is available to anybody. So help yourselves get on there, muck around and see what you like to do and what we might be missing. So the Irwin card is a new one we just added and we added that because uh, you know they they were trying to find some place besides the lessons learned site to post stuff and and so we added that and we put it under the data management because it's it you know if you look at the at the home page on that it's got incidents resources fire environment fuels right and it's like Irwin kind of it's in most multiples right and at its core is a data exchange service so we put it under data management just so that people try and look for it under incident or under resources or under some of that type of stuff but um the the goal with that then is to allow Erwin to post documents that the rest of you are trying to get to and have it be publicly available and not have to go through the pain of the lessons learned site. And especially since it's offline. Especially since it's offline. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I don't know if you wanted to add anything here. Uh, no, but uh -uh, we should have some stuff up there for you for tomorrow. So, Chris, I saw you raise your hand. So. Is wildfire.gov is strictly the application. 
technology-based? You know, I, I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be, but the way that this is kind of rolled out so far looks like that. And so, you know, I, I've talked with Ryan about kind of how this looks right now, and I, I know he would like some feedback and to kind of help clean this up a little bit. There's some stuff that's, mm, you know, kind of odd things and weird, you know, things in odd places type stuff. But so I, so I don't know how, and I don't know if anybody from Forest Service is here, maybe that can talk about like how this is, it says wildfire.gov, but my understanding was that this was also, wildfire.gov was supposed to be like the GAC websites and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I, so I don't know how this works exactly. It's just, it's available to us and we needed a place that was open and, and it seems to be working. Yeah, like, yeah. Gaps for one, um, mental health is another big one. Yeah. The, they've asked for the site, and this is, you know, application information portal. Oh, that's IT, that's not mental health. Yeah, yeah. And so I, it, you know, it, it's obviously a need in the community that we don't really have. It's like either it's NWCG or it feels like it's this application side, and there's really kind of there's other things that don't fit into those two buckets and figuring out how to make that work. But maybe maybe talking with Brian is a way to see what options might be available. I, I think Deb is not on the project anymore, so I don't know really who's, I would just go to Ryan. Yeah. Ryan the branding. It, it is a Drupal site. They have what, three or four different page templates, but right now the original, or it's designed specifically for applications. So the original intent when the contract was let was that this would be just for applications. But obviously uh, thought processes have changed and needs have widened. So we've now been included on this website. We are kind of the odd odd duck out or the odd card out, if you will, on, on this page. But yes, the original intent was for applications only, and now they've added us in was to know where it will go in the near future. Yeah. So program board can fix that, huh, Chris? Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, it's a domain with all sorts of possibilities. Wildfire.gov can do a lot with that. So a work in progress, I would call it. <laughs> but it does give us some capability that we haven't had before. And hopefully, we'll, as we start populating that, at least at least we'll have a place to go to get some stuff that we've been struggling with in the past. Any other questions or comments on that? No, but I might need some help later, because I keep putting documents there, and I have no idea where they're going. <laughs> 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 you know, welcome to Drupal. Somewhere um, that is. <laughs> yeah, Steve. Um, so that was one of the things when we talked about we talked with the Irwin team. We talked about the fact that they've got the Forest and Rangelands website out there, and we'll we'll work to be cleaning this up. We just barely got the Irwin card added, and Kara's still learning how to put stuff in there. So, like, this is hot off the press four days ago. So. <laughs> It, it'll be a work in progress, but yeah, we we will and manage that as best we can. Okay, uh, Steve, do you have another question? Oh yeah, I, well I just want to say thanks and good work. Uh, the other thing, um, it's kind of hard to uh, find the information on how to get an Irwin Observer account. So Kara, Kara knows what I'm talking about. Um, it's currently most accessible, but quite buried in a document that's posted on the Nick Intel web page. So I guess as you guys tune everything up, the Irwin team might want to maybe think about uh, providing an easier way for people to figure out how to get that Geo Portal account first and then uh, get connected to Irwin Observer.
Um, so real quick, Gabriella, can you just give an update on the Adobe campaign? Abby, who works with Skip, and then and I, we just got our user accounts yesterday for Adobe campaign, uh, which means in the near future, we'll be able to set up our domain, which will be Wildland Fire Data, and then we're going to identify our subdomain. So at its heart, Adobe campaign is a, is a marketing platform that is allowing us to do all of these email services. So we'll be able to create very targeted subdomains used to communicate out with the community. So folks such as the Irwin team, could use our exchange subdomain and then FAM that needed to send out some email uh, notifications related to uh, something to do with FAM off. We would envision using uh, like an enterprise application subdomain. We're going to have a data management one, a data governance, and those are just be ways to target how our, our emails are appearing in everybody's inboxes, which would be nice. We'll get to really brand them for what we're trying to communicate and we'll People will be able to manage their own subscriptions. So you won't be having to manage your email list and your email inbox. And so our idea is Abby and I will be admins, but based on campaigns in these subdomains, we'll be able to identify additional users who need to be able to send communications. That's, yeah, but it's moving forward. Our user accounts was the first one. Next step is them helping us set up our subdomain and domains. Yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that just because getting the information out is always a challenge and being able to target it is going to be helpful. So, and the cool thing is we have enough user uh, capacity. Um, we told them our, you know, we were going to have 25,000 users and only a small portion of those were going to be DOI. So that's why we got our own our own domain area in there and so we can so it gives us a lot of flexibility and control and so if you have like a need to communicate to big groups on a regular basis then let's talk because we can we can build those out and give you access and, and communicate in different ways so all right any us up that's you we're up you're okay. up <laughs> the, the tall guys are up. I'm just going to stand here while Chris is getting set up. So, um, uh, I don't know where to start. So, uh, NASF, the non federal aspect, we're going to do here. Um, we're going to focus mostly on fuels today, but we have a lot of people spinning plates going on. And um, I think I was commenting to Chris earlier that. Um, like the Inform Fuels came up, and I said, it'd be nice if we had one agency to deal with to handle all their, their application requirements. I mean, we have 59, and everyone has a different way to keep their looks. Some has, uh, uh, some have um, very elaborate systems that we're integrating with. Uh, some have nothing. They're just above the level of this is a mouse and this is a keyboard or they don't have any staff to do things. So we, we have all aspects of that, but we need data from all of those. Um, my two friends over the last couple of years, Bill and Ira, has really complicated my world <laughs> because they have different reporting requirements for the money that the federal government is printing and sending up rapidly. And so that comes back. So for just Bill, there could be 25 different funding mechanisms that the state agencies on these projects have to report on and have to designate distinctly where that money comes from and how they spend it. It's a nightmare for them. We have, they'll come up and they'll go, I didn't even know there was money available there. And, and so hire is another way. There's just all these different funding mechanisms. So just to track that. So we all started with, we're familiar with Swarm, uh, shared wildfire risk mitigation. That was a proof of concept that we did of what we could visualize of what they, and I think Chris is going to talk about that for just a second, but that's the end of a lot of work that has to take place. And so uh, what have we been doing this for four months, the data, three or four months? Yeah. 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 About three months. And so you'll see where we're at. Um, we're taking a different approach. We heard very clearly that agencies, state agencies do not want another system to enter data into. They already have multiples of that, so they don't want to do that. So we're harvesting the data. We're going to go get it. 
Now there's some that don't have that capability and we're going to have to figure out them. Uh, that's obvious, but the majority of them were able to harvest the information. And so I'm not going to talk anymore. Chris is here. Chris Garrick, I'll let him introduce himself. He's from Timmins Group. He's our contractor on this effort. And um, he's pretty bright, very nice guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice so, um, yeah, I'm Chris Garrick from Timmins Group. And this presentation, the core of this presentation was uh, from an update we did in DC with uh, Jaleth and James Fordner and some of the stakeholders for this project. Um, so, but I thought it'd be good to use this as a framework. I had a lot of detail based on the interest in this group, but this is a good way, I think, to set the context for the projects that were involved in the ESF. So I just need to add one more thing, sorry. So we always struggle telling the, our story. Are you going to talk about that, telling our story? Yeah. We always have a hard time telling an accurate and compelling story that's the same across the board from all the agencies. Very difficult. So many years ago, we started a process called uh, performance measures inside of NASF. And state foresters got together. They prioritized and listed about, you know, sort of right there in the middle of performance measures. I don't know, there's like 65 or in the 60s performance measures. They focused on six or eight at the top, and three or, three or four of the top are fire related. And so that's what we have focused on. And the one we're going to talk about with fuels is one of those. It's a critical performance measure. And that way we can tell our story. So when we go to Capitol Hill and we talk to them, we can say that we're being good stewards of our money that you've granted to us and that we're not going out and just doing random acts of spending. Um, and that's the biggest question that we constantly get is, are you effectively spending the money that we're giving to you? OK. Yeah. Community Wildfire Defense Grants. Yeah, that's probably a lot of forward acronyms. That's a billion dollar program, grant program. Right? In the image, she's wanting to collect the whole set. That's a forest <laughs> service program. So we are we are framing this story, this presentation in the, in the national cohesive strategy. So we'll kind of go through the three legs and relate that to some of the projects we're doing. But like Keith mentioned, the NASF performance measures, the swarm uh, shared wildfire risk mitigation portal prototype that we did, that kind of led to this project. So that's kind of how we got here. Um, and you know, through all those projects over the last few years, we've Determine that we do need comprehensive geospatial reporting, um, specifically looking at NIFORS, uh, which is going to be deprecated. You know, NIFORS does not support you know, tracking, tracking and the collective investments on a map, so definitely lacks spatial geospatial data. It, it, what we found through the performance measures, interviewing OMB and, and um, folks like that, is that. And they really need some of this geospatial data to tell compelling stories, like you mentioned. Um, and then through our prototype with the shared wildfire risk mitigation portal, which is focused on shared stewardship, you know, we found that there is a lack of collaborative planning, and that's kind of those are the needs. Um, so if we look at NIF fours, you know, there is um, work planned being tracked, but you know, we don't know where it is. So acres of treatment, dollars of treatment are, are being entered, but there's no geospatial footprint tied to those metrics um, on, the, on the three legs of the use of strategy. So if you look at the communities at risk, the um, number of fire management risk plans, the number of uh, SFA community applications received, again, numbers in the system, no geospatial tie. Uh, and then on the response side, the number of uh, applications for uh, volunteer fire assistance. Uh, he said not through most familiar with that term, Nathan Grants. That those those numbers are tracked in the force, but again, no spatial tie. So um, the goal for what we're endeavoring on within ASF is to uh, report actuals by place. So whether it's fire district, by treatment, polygon by priority areas by community we want to tie those actuals uh, to geospatial footprint um, and another goal is 
as Keith mentioned, is do more analysis and storytelling with the data. Um, so being able to, and, and kind of what we did was, uh, usually efforts like this, and we've you know, I've been application involved for 20 years, we start with collecting the data, building applications to collect data. We kind of spun that around and said, okay, let's build out some prototype dashboards, analysis, story maps, um, output to get feedback from and figure out where, what are the questions we're trying to answer you know, before we start collecting the data. So this is a, just a, a screenshot of, and I'll, I'll pull this up, I'll pull up actually an actual demo, but you know, we took the data that we harvested from, not harvested, but we got from manual data calls through all the states for the performance measures project and so those all so all that data together. So think of like random shape files, and geo databases, all of different schemas. Kind of so we sewed that together manually. Um, really turned out to be a bunch of not polygons, no no attribute standardization. But use that as a basis, and then develop some. We enriched the data to say, okay, let's um, let's get values at risk. Let's get. Uh, geospatial buckets. We'll talk a little bit about that, and to, to answer questions. And, and you know, in this case, where are the treatments? Where are the treatments on the ground? The investments on the ground that are uh, impacted by high wildfire or very high wildfire hazard potential, and they're intersecting with public drinking watersheds. So those are actual questions that are being asked by OMB, by legislators. You know, so we need ways to answer those questions. Um, and so I'll go through this. Is that because the treatment affects the drinking water? Yes. Do you have an Airbnb in one of those areas? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Has your water been affected? <laughs> I think so. Can <laughs> on my Airbnb? No. So, yeah. Kind of the goal is to, to to look at this comprehensive treatment data, the national treatment data set, overlay the values at risk to shore, right? You know, whether it's social vulnerability or public drinking water or whatever else comes up. Um, we developed uh, over the course of collective uh, efforts a national wildfire hazard potential data set. Uh, we have regional data sets. To look at hazard potential, and then what's kind of missing, what this effort's going to fulfill, is um, state uh, state reported treatments sewn together in a national coverage. So, really, the goal for storytelling is where we need to aggregate all the collective investments on the ground. So, we've talked about federal investments, um, state and tribal not being that's that's a missing data set, right? Geospatial wise, local and NGO that's another. Uh, priority that's coming, but telling the story with these collective and where these collective investments are in relation to things we care about in relation to priorities based on wildfire hazard potential. So um, again, where we kind of started was started the project developing some of these prototype dashboards. So um, you know, we, we to, to engage those higher level folks and the folks that are as, asking these questions, you know, we looked and said, well, let's let's bucket this into geo themes. So based on states, or this is a prototype, wildfire, crisis landscapes, watersheds, congressional districts, based on those specific boundaries, you know, I want to enrich all of the treatment polygons and be able to see, you know, based on a state, based on a wildfire crisis landscape, based on a watershed, what are the values at risk for that in, in that boundary? Where are the investments? Where is the uh, hazard? And then being able to tell stories from that geotheme perspective. You know, we can always go to a map and look at those individual treatments, go zoom down in there, but being able to answer questions at that geotheme level was super important um, to tell stories. The other, and now I'm just going through this quick because there's a ton of content, and I'm happy to take questions too as, we, as I kind of go through this. Um, we talked about uh, CWDG grant funds, so billion dollars being pushed down to the locals 
and um, that application process is about a year in. There's several rounds of funding that's going to be distributed to the locals, but being able to provide transparency on where that where those where that money is being um, pushed down on the ground, where that where the who's receiving the funding, being able to look at well um, of those applications that received funding, uh, where those focused on where the which areas are low income areas which are in areas of high wildfire hazard potential, um, which are impacted by severe disaster. Those are actually part of the grant criteria for CWDG funding. So being able to provide transparency in terms of where is the funding going and is it in the highest priority area based on hazard, based on value, or risk, based on you know, social vulnerability. So those are just some quick examples of kind of where we started. Chief, did you see Don put a question in is there a state representative on this or is it still in the planning process um it's well underway and it's all state it's an nasf it's an, yeah it's an nasf project yes yeah, so we have there, there's numerous projects going on and all of them have state representation okay was the money you did the analysis before the money is sent to the locals or after well that was after sorry yeah, that's a good question that's after the round one funding Okay. So round two is coming out. It's yeah. announced. It's, it's been it's announced. Application. Yeah. So then are you going to use this when the applications come in to decide if it's going to the right spot? Not yet, but hopefully for probably not for round two because round two was just announced. We just we literally just got this contract to analyze round one data. Okay. So it's a little bit behind, but, but maybe for three. Yeah, for round three, yeah. Rather than after the fact. Yeah. Like, oh, whoops. <laughs> and on top of that, which we're going to talk about, there is. There is no reporting process for accomplishments. So the treatments that are being done, that are being uh, granted funding for to the locals, there's nowhere for those locals to report those treatments currently. So we are, I'll talk a little bit about that, but we're doing some discovery on how that data should be reported and how those investments can be integrated into this national data set. Yeah, you're not saying that that's not critical and needed. There's just no funding. That to develop that, I guess. Yeah, not yet. It was a push, right? They, they got a billion dollars, get it out to the onto the ground as fast as possible. But we don't have some subsection track. And 45 <laughs> days to roll out the first two hundred and fifty million. Yeah. The first announcement. Yeah, Forest Service it was crazy for that. So um, we'll bucket each of the projects into the three legs of the coastal strategy. So first talking about resilient landscapes. Um, the, you might have heard this term, National Fuels Initiative. This is what, what Keith was talking about. We're working with all of the states and territories to understand their readiness to give us treatment data and for us to intake it to harvest them. Um, and then we're building a, uh, we're calling a landscapes or accomplishments reporting module, essentially a replacement for NIFMORS for that specific uh, treatment data that will support SFA uh, bill money or funding. SFA stands for state fire assistance. And then produce dashboards and story maps. So um, getting to more of the specifics that, that you all care about, you know, the National Fuels Treatment Data, our goal, is, uh, NASF's goal is to aggregate as many fuel treatments boundaries across the country, regardless if you did it, how it was funded and for the treatment site. So what we're doing is we've developed a, a data harvesting pipeline infrastructure. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. We've also created and are iterating on the NFT data model, uh, starting with NWCG data standards. And then we're getting states and territories onboarded. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, how we're doing that. So this is a really high level diagram, um, but essentially what we're doing, like Keith mentioned, is we're working with each state in order to um, get around double reporting. We're going to them and trying to harvest data from existing feature services. So part of that is working and talking to each state and territory and saying, okay, what is, what is your maturity in terms of geospatial data with, with regards to treatments? Uh, and then actually using, we're using something called FME server, 
uh, the BTL tool to uh, not have to force those states to change their data model, but to essentially map or crosswalk their data to, to the national fuels um, data standard. And that is going to aggregate it into the national fuel treatment data. So we'll also be intaking the Fed owned feature services. And then for, we'll call them the, um, just we'll call them not uh, the, uh, no, the, the term, but the, uh, the have nots. So the states and territories that don't have the GIS capability to stand up a feature service have nots, providing them a tool to actually get their treatments in or help them like Skip was showing, set up and set up a RGS field maps, um, field mapping workflow. A lot of states, what, what we're finding is that a lot of states, you know, want to you know, maintain and manage their treatment data. They're not going to go into some separate portal that, that NES has to standing up and put their data in. Hey, Chris, Steve Manti has a stand up. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thanks. So, thanks. Chris, and yeah, hey, Chris, thanks. So on this particular chart, right, and I've talked a little, it's been a while since I talked to him about this, but for all the data intake, right, so you look at those three boxes, you've got the states, the 59 states, is that what we said? All the, the federal data, and then you've got the, the treatment mapping tool. What, what do the gaps look like, right? So to get the national fuels treatment and the stuff we saw there at the beginning, to get that to 100%, what, what, how bad are the gaps, right? Even at the federal level, do you have what you need out of the federal systems or out of the mapping tool uh, tools? Um, see what I'm getting at? How, how big is that gap? Yeah, that, that's, that's a big question. And that's what we're, we're actually in the middle of this right now. So we're, we're starting with the state, the 59 states and territories, 59, um, to understand where those gaps are. And what we found is it's very encouraging. A lot of the states are very interested in maturing, you know, subscribing to the national field treatment data model, making changes. They're, they're, they're big in supporting it, especially since it will eliminate double reporting from uh, triple reporting for land fire, for NASF performance measures, for uh, net forest reporting. So, answer your question for Steve. We don't know. It, yeah. They'll answer your question in just a minute. They'll give you a actual percentages of where things are at yeah. um, and the big gaps we're going to find i believe are, you know there's going to be gaps throughout all the states and the federal and all that but, but we have other like the ngos and private contractors and burners that we, we can't get their data or sometimes it's hard to even find that data so those are some big gaps that we're still chasing um, we've got tools and incentives for them to do that and um you, know, you never want to hold funding hostage because uh, that's always the bad word when you talk to uh, leaders. But, um, you know, there's always funding tied to things that may help motivate getting some of that data in. But, but he's going to stand tight for just a second. <laughs> okay, He'll standing stand. by. Yeah, I mean, yeah, preliminarily, it's going to be the have nots, the states without GIS capability. It's going to be the NGOs, um, TNCs, the the folks that are doing a lot of prescribed burning but don't have a, uh, you know, there's a gap there. Um, animations. Uh, so just a, just a screenshot of, you know, we we are creating kind of custom FME workbenches or EPL processes for each each of these entities, you know, to, to eliminate that double reporting. So a lot of maintenance work. There's there's work to maintain. The links between the states and the national fuels treatment data model. Um, but what you see here is actually, I'll go back. The screenshot, what's in green, is actually data that's being harvested from a number of states. So we're iteratively working to harvest this treatment data. And th these are pulled, the states, the, the green data are states that we're harvesting directly from real time from the nature services that they're publishing, those states are publishing. And the yellow is manual data calls that we've got over the last five to ten years. That we just put on there. They're dumb, but it's just a plot on the ground. We have some. We have some more visualizations of that too. So this is um, this is the NFT data model. We're you know we're not ready to submit it yet for 
or feedback, but um, because we're getting, we're learning more as we talk to each each of the states and territories. But I know this is it's a fairly simplified data model. I won't go through each of it, but you can see where each attribute. You can see we're tracking things like acres reported, treatment categories, uh, biomass utilized, completion date, um, federal funding classification. And we'll circle back to that and uh, accomplishment entity. So those are just some of the attributes tracking. In terms of onboarding states, um, there's really, you know, kind of iteratively worked ourselves into this process, but we're, it's really a four step process. We're engaging each state individually to inform them of what we're doing uh, and to, you know, schedule, we're calling an intake session. And we're doing the intake, which is to actually meet with them. I'll show you what we're what we're asking them, but to get details on their service, their maturity, their are they tracking data, treatment data geospatially, are they tracking in spreadsheets, you know, where they are. Um, and then if they do have future service, we're actually harvesting it uh, through our pipeline and then crosswalking their data to our data. Data you're ingesting, is that that's accomplished work, planned work? Yeah. It's both, both, both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. And what we're finding is some states have just completed or just tracking completed treatments. Some states are tracking both. What we're pulling, pulling the data model can distinguish between this is a plan yeah. activity versus an accomplishment. Yeah, correct. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that some of the states, once they go through this process, they say, oh, we want to update our process to add more staff or to do a better job. And so there's that maintenance process, that loop you keep having to go through is they realize, oh, we could do better. So it's been very good. Yeah, this this was this was important to kind of inform like the more of the um, key the executive stakeholders of like this isn't a one-time thing, right? You can't just harvest the data and just sit it down. It's gonna be constant maintenance as as these states are and all the entities are improving their their data collection and their data models. So we've already found that. We're in taking data and we're actually going to have to go back to five states already after just three months to go make changes based on our meetings together or their, or their desire to, to enhance uh, their tracking of treatments. So you, you'll notice this doesn't add up to 59. Uh, we're still talking to a number of states, scheduling intakes. As you can imagine, it's hard to get the right people in the right meetings to get this all done. Um, but this is a visualization of kind of where we are. It looks way better online. Yeah. Um, I'm blow this up. How did it go? We'll screen it. Okay. So this is kind of a map of where we are in the intake process. Oh, it's hard to see. Um, generally, the green is our states that we're actually harvesting data from. Some of them are, are ready for maintenance. Some of them are actually just harvested and good to go. Some are pending harvest. Harvest meaning like we're sucking their data into the National Fuels Treatment Data Model. And then there's um, a number of follow-up meetings in the blue family of colors intake meetings being scheduled or uh, or it has been scheduled. So those are states we're working with. And then pending outreach, these gray states are ones that we just haven't gotten to yet. That looks purple there, but uh, yeah, it's really washed out. Right, it looks right here. Um, and so we also, wow, okay. can't read the state's names, but we've classified these states into tiers. So tier one being like the most mature in terms of data being captured. I'll talk a little bit more about what, the, what we consider the definition of tiers are. Tier one to tier three. So a lot more tier threes than tier ones, as you can imagine. Um, tier one states ready or near ready with minimal assistance and terminal changes for harvesting. So example for California. Um, Tier two, state can be ready with some assistance and internal changes that might need alternative data sharing options. So those are states that they do, you know, we're 
they're really capable of making changes. They have the resources, uh, but not quite ready. Maybe it's not published. They don't have permissions to expose the data or whatever the number of reasons. Tier three, they can't be ready without significant assistance in internal changes. Example name, they have their tracking data and their treatment data in the spreadsheet. No geospatial footprint, uh, very minimal attribution. So going to take a lot of work to get them to a harvesting state. So um, we'll go to all these details because there's a lot to cover, but um, tier ones, they do have centralized mapping of treatment databases, meaning they are, and the majority of their treatments are being mapped. So what we also found is a lot of states are just tracking certain treatments or they're tracking treatments in different places. They're siloed. They might be tracking prescribed burns over here, mechanical treatments over here, uh, separating it out by funding sources. So a lot of um, challenges there to kind of pull it together into centralized. But in tier one, in general, they've already centralized their treatment data sets. Uh, feature service is ready and we can be, it's either publicly accessible or it can be shared. Uh, they do have the staff to maintain the capabilities and then they generally require the least onboarding from, from us. Tier two, um, yeah, like I mentioned, the treatment polygon data can be collected, but it may be stored in several different data repositories. Um, I think a good example is Texas. You know, they, they have their treatment data stored all over the place, but Kurt and Javier are very, uh, who are, their, who are the, the data stewards or GIS team, um, have the capabilities and the know-how to, to aggregate all that data. So third, they kind of are moving up, move, moved up to a tier one. They were a tier two. You know, and then tier three, limited. Like I mentioned, that the main example, no operational data collection, of fuels treatment data. Um, and a lot of times they don't have the staff or the dedicated staff to, to make this happen. And they, they require a significant level of onboarding. So um, again, this is a map of the harvested data. We have a dashboard that shows real-time status of where the work's happening. Uh, sorry, where the harvest, where the harvesting is, where we're harvesting data from. So these are the states that we're harvesting from and we're continually updating this and adding it. So treatment acres and preferred treatments. Um, and so, in terms of the intake, kind of what's happening right now, we have a we, we have a old school Word document. We're, we're working through understanding, documenting the points of contact from each state. Essentially, going through a number of questions with them. Um, I'm talking to each state essentially and, and getting information about you know how they track treatments, who's tracking treatments, you know, are they tracking it spatially, what attributes are they tracking. Are they tracking just pro proposed and or completed or both? You know, are they track where are they tracking their um, their funding? Um, do they track funding in fiscal year and dollar amounts per treatment? Those type of questions. Then adding uh, an actual feature service if they have it, so we can kind of version this document. And then crosswalking. So. In the case where they do have feature services, our states have feature services, we'll actually on the phone work with them and crosswalk their data to, to the uh, National Fuels Treatment Data Model. So National Fuels Field on the left, crosswalk for the state data that can attribute the name they call it on the right. So this helps inform more ETLT to create the more benches. Um, I added this slide yesterday when we were talking because um, one thing that's missing we found is a consolidate or a, a source system of record list for federal uh, grant programs. So every state, it seems, is calling different federal grant funding programs, different things, different names, names have changed. So there's lack of consistency. There's no way to really map um, the federal grant funding program means that a state is calling into a federal standard. So we are working with like Tim Melcher and some other folks to create that 
uh, list of finite list of federal program grant funding programs because we are going to be capturing <coughs> Ideally, it's an optional field, but in order to really um, be able to tell the story of where the where the funding is going on the ground, we need this information. So uh, this is a very complex diagram, but all it's saying is, you know, we we need some help to create this federal grant funding program list. This list of federal grant funding. Programs. You're working, um, with, you're working with Tim. Yeah. On that. yeah, Tim and Brad, Tim Pinter's the lead on that. Yeah. Right. But it, when, when we talked about domains and creating master data lists of domain values, it seems like one that could be useful for a lot of different programs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> If it's, with, if it's with the organizational data, this oh, makes sense. Oh. I would be interested. It just with shapes, the states down the bottom. <laughs> you uh, kind of shapes. So. <laughs> I know which one. There's kidney state. <laughs> um, so the goal is, like we mentioned, is to create this national funeral treatment database. We're trying to aggregate as much treatment data as possible. And then we're also creating a replacement for the treatment data that's being going to be reported into NIF boards by the states. So that's really to enable state program managers to satisfy their federal grant accomplishment reporting on those treatments. So two separate kind of components, but obviously related. So all the data that we can harvest from states will be available in this accomplishment reporting module. So in theory, you do a good job reporting spatially. You can harvest that data. You open up your NIF Force 2.0 and see that data in there already. So uh, along those lines, kind of where we're, we're just starting development of this landscape resiliency accomplishment reporting arm, landscape arm. Um, and let me get to a better screenshot. So um, if I log in as a state, user, I should be able to see my accomplishments summed up in terms of based on the data that's being harvested. Um, the total acres of hazardous fuels treatments, the average cost per acre, the it broken up by treatment type, by grant funding programs. And so we'll soon be able to show this interface with harvested data. Um, along Beside that, we need to provide you know, a little bit washed out, but an ability for states to go into this reporting module and add non mapped acres. So we understand that not every accomplishment is going to be mapped, and we need to, do need to uh, fulfill federal grant reporting requirements. So being able to report non fill in the blanks essentially, put the non mapped acres in there, providing that functionality. So we are working also iteratively as we start getting feedback to create more dashboards, story maps, um, dashboards that I showed earlier. And what's next? We're going to we're continuing to onboard states, do harvesting. We will be harvesting data from Forest Service and DOI, international fuels. Um, there'll be a, another iteration, multiple iterations of story maps and dashboards to help those conversations and then uh, develop state reporting your input interfaces and certifications roll out to production, which is a little bit further away. Uh, timeline at the end. Um, to Steve's point, we are we are looking at um, partner investments. So we do understand that TNC uh, NFF, they do have keystone agreements with the Forest Service. They're accomplishing doing treatment work. We need to we need to capture that. Uh, we don't currently have funding or a, or a way to track those uh, partners, but we know that's that's coming. Um, we also are working on prescribed burn portals, so being able to get at those. 
uh, entities that are capturing the prescribed burden, PBAs, prescribed burden associations, the, the folks, the NGOs that are doing prescribed burden work, collecting that data um, through other portals. That tool is in effect being used across the southern part of the country. Yeah, currently. I hope it is. Yeah, we do have a uh, Minnesota got a grant to build a, uh, a prescribed burn portal as well. So we're looking at extending that to the northeast and west. So I'll, to the second leg of the cohesive strategy, the wildfire response leg, um, we are working or have have actually mapped all the fire response district, fire district response areas nationwide. Um, that's really going to be critical in co connecting investments to places and responders, and then um, we're building the local response arm, capacity arm, which really will help support the deprecation of the force. So the BFA grant reporting, BIL and the RFA grant reporting, that is being, that's what's being captured in this application. I'll show a screenshot of that. So first kind of what we, what we've created in this, again, super, super uh, grainy, but we've captured a, or created a national data set or that maps all the fire district response areas it did not exist previously. Um, and this is how all that data John's not in his head. Yeah, this this is how we received all most of this data through paper maps, shape files, big data aggregation effort. Um, we digitized or imported or you know look got that crown type maps and created these fire response districts and created a national data set. You'll notice a few holes in there and we are working on that uh, in certain states to get that data. So that data set, I did um, we did chat about put, putting down the NIPSI uh, data portal at some point very soon so it can be more accessible to others. But that data set is critical for accomplishment reporting because now we can tie grant funding to spatial areas to fire response districts so that's kind of where that comes in so you can see here we can we can better visualize and map where the demand is versus supply for vfa grants the fire assistant grants um, green being these are and then this is this is just a kind of a prototype map but green being fire response district areas that are funded that got VFA grants, yellow being the ones that asked for it but did not get it. So those are where like fire stations respond? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of pulled through I it. That, I would, yeah. yeah. So that yeah, that, that never existed. Yeah. Um, I think the fire administration was trying to do that as well. Talk to them about that. Yeah, they, and are they excited? I mean, they're, they're, they're very excited about that. this. Uh, but we have, they understand. Everybody understands that there's a lot of maintenance that's going to go into this. Mm -hmm. But we have a initial 88 percent of the country is mapped. That's awesome. I think they did. They start doing that as well too. I don't think so. Okay. I, mean, you, I thought they started, but it, they may have, but they stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Might want to see if they have their own it's a challenge. <laughs> well, and it goes back to you know, not even knowing all the fire departments that are there. I know. Do they have an FDID? And I yeah, it's, it's we've had and one too. What is a fire response? Calling individual fire departments. And like, oh yeah, sure, I can take a picture on the wall and drive Crayola circle around our fire department response. And that's actual pictures of mm -hmm. how we got stuff back. That's crazy. Yeah, a lot of reports, um, GIS technicians you know, calling calling people, you know, saying, please, like, whatever you have, send it to us. Did you did you ask them to then please start using what you created to maintain it? <laughs> and if it changes, let you know. <laughs> yeah, and we, and we are hoping to this application is is a replacement for NIP wars for uh, state administrators to track the applications that are received for BFA funding and, and we provided tools to do bulk upload so you can you know, or download. So essentially you can a, a state administrator will see all their fire departments. Actually, I think I have a screenshot of this. 
Yeah. So uh, a state administrator, for example, state of South Dakota, will, will get a download of all of the fire departments in their state spatially connected to their fire response district. And then we're also, because there was a lack of prioritization in terms of where does this money go? Is it going to the highest priority areas, fire response areas? So we're providing them with some just general uh, rich wildfire hazard potential per fire response, per fire department, uh, response area and population wildfire occurrences. So with the hope that they, the state administrators can use this data prioritize where the funding is going. Are, are either one of you familiar with Corinne Miles or Lauren Miller Forest Service? Uh, no, we're more focused. So what's next? Um, fire, fire district response areas. We need to do some more mapping, for example, because there's a huge hole in Kentucky. <laughs> there's data for Kentucky. No one's picking up the phone. Yeah, no one's picking up the phone. <laughs> they asked. <laughs> <laughs> they were working. They're working on a nine statewide nine one one system, and they pushed pushed us off to them, and they were not ready for us. And so they're starting to trickle in now. But we're also uh, we're working on some operational insight dashboards. So this is an example of a dashboard embedded in our application. Again, it's it's fake data, but you get the point of, you know, we can we can have some uh, operational insights into the grants that are funded, the grants that have been requested, the amount invested to date, where it's going, you know, whether it's being spent on training or equipment or uh, personnel, and then also tracking spatially and tie back to the fire response districts, where that funding is going on the map. Um, so a lot of stuff in, in phase two, kind of, I'll just flash this up there, but this is kind of, you know, there's work still to be done. Um, and these are some of, the, some of the things that need to be done. Third leg, uh, fire adaptive communities. So we are, like I mentioned earlier, we are, um, we are scoping how to track SFA and fill accomplishment data. So that's that's more of the discovery phase where we're you know we're, we're we will be building a reporting system. Currently, uh, it's not as good to build the SFA and BIL accomplishment reporting. Um, we're also going to be re re redefining the communities at risk. Um, how to objectively quantify assistance to those. Um, that's a whole other topic. Anybody's familiar with that? Um, communities at risk data set. Oh, yeah. And then um, build and release that community's accomplishment reporting module. So that's that's kind of what's next on that side. And then the intersection of fire adaptive communities and resilient landscapes, that's where this community wildfire defense grant comes in. And like I mentioned right now, we're uh, phase one of funding has been has been released. Phase two is out for application. So we are quickly trying to provide analysis and visualization into what happened in funding release one. Who got the money? Where was it? Was it actually done in priority areas? And kind of iterating on that. So showed a dashboard about that. Um, we're also, as I mentioned, you know, there's no place for the locals to report what they have actually accomplished with this funding. So that's a huge priority, um, especially as you know the funding um, performance reporting is due. Uh, they need somewhere to put that data, and obviously we want it spatially so we can aggregate it with the rest of the national fuels agreements. So the announcement for phase two just came out in the last 30 days. OMB is already knocking our forest service door saying, well, what are you doing? Where's the money gone? I mean, they are on it. Yeah, and so it looks like we'll probably be entering round two data manually. 
you know, we just got shipped a, a stack of PDF applications. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no data support for it, but we're going to be entering that in and then working with the um, working to develop a reporting system. So we're identifying, sorry, identifying uh, subject matter experts to assist in defining these requirements, conducting discovery workshops, and then we'll develop those requirements for CWDG accomplishment reporting, and then eventually uh, hopefully build that accomplishment reporting module so we can capture all of this, all those accomplishments with the rest of the national field treatments. Um, on the what's next side too, we are looking at um, we have built CWPP tracking tools for the Northeast and Midwest region as part of a project with them. So um, I think we, most of us know that there, there isn't a national CWPP data set that's being maintained. Um, there, there is potential, like in the Northeast and Midwest, this is a tool that is being encouraged to be used. Uh, we can't really see this at all. Um, tracking where CWPPs are active where they're in development, where they're inactive, where there's no plans. Dude, where CDPPs are we need long fire protection plans. That's a prerequisite to getting uh, funding from the CDPPG grant. Chris Strobel. Here we got no Chris in the room. Um, so this is what we were talking about the other day, right? So you've got some folks in, oh, maybe it was Ramona. I just talked to about that. I bet it was Ramona. <laughs> Anyway, we were talking about there's some some work uh, on the Forest Service side where some of the forest or regions have collected some of this data, but they weren't really sure like where to put it or what to do with it or any of that type of stuff. And so this is a place I wanted to kind of make some of those connections that if you guys, if NASF is going to have a place for that information to go, as the feds may be doing some of that work locally that we want to figure out how to get that in there, right? And I'll be reaching out. That's why I was asking if these guys knew Corinne Miles or Lauren Miller, because there are connections within the Forest Service to these same site types of data. Yeah. And I, I'd like to, I'd like them to be talking with these guys and say, okay, can we circle the wagons and work together? Or <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. do this individually. So, so the, this, this application, again, was built uh, through funding for the Northeast Midwest State Foresters Alliance. So um, we harvested data from the Forest Service. Quinn Chavez actually has a, had a CWPP data set used as a starting point. And then the states like New Jersey, for example, can't really see it, but they've gone in there and updated their CWPP information. And so the, the, the hope is here that we can have a up to date CWPP layer. But again, this is this is more for the Northeast Midwest region. The other other thing we have kind of uh, going on at more at the state level is um, being able to uh, create what the concept of a living CVPP. So being able to not have a uh, just a, a, a paper CVPP document, but to be able to real time show the hazard, the com communities, the response resources, the values at risk in a dashboard form, in a digital format that is not dated as soon as it's put on paper. So this is just this is just a wireframe, but the goal is to build this into more of a living CDBPP concept so you can, as a author of a CDBPP, you can pull all this data in <coughs> to generate your CDBPP, where the hazards are, where the response resources are, where the values at risk are without having to manually go through all that. But what will they do with all the binders? <laughs> <laughs> Our goal is to find funding to do the other two regions in the southern and the western part of the country to just make this a border to border process. So, yeah, success. What does success look like? Um, they, Success is like showing the impact of the shared investments. So nationally, from all the all the legs of the cohesive strategy, from all the partners, cumulative over time, by numerous geographies and from various funding sources. So that's kind of the big picture of what's hopefully successful look like. So there's a really uh, 
uh, under under uh, story here. We can go back to the congressional district. But we have our state foresters and others visit Capitol Hill frequently. And they walk into, you know, they, they you'll have somebody there on Capitol Hill that represents a congressional district, which is part of the state. And the question is, what is my, what is the contributions been? What are the investments been made in my contract, in my district? Not statewide. They go, oh yeah, that's nice statewide. But what's in my category? What's in my area? And we're able to provide that. A lot of pictures and then we're getting great feedback so we're trying to tell a compelling story we know that like the bill and ira money is first investment we want to make sure that we're queued up and ready to go for investment number two that we can tell a compelling story that's really important and get into the end here but um we also are putting thought into you'll notice different ways of reporting accomplishments and not we're, we're, from a user experience standpoint not every state employee is going to be responsible for all the different accomplishment reporting that needs to happen so this is more of a comprehensive website to point people to the right reporting modules so all those different arms that i mentioned would be kind of housed in this more of a cms content management solution to aggregate everything. So estimated timelines, you know, we have those three legs. Um, we're still kind of working out when, um, but I, Keith, I don't know if you want to talk to this slide at all, but. Yeah, I can talk. Uh, so the BFA, the top one, is, major, is pretty much done. Um, I, we're putting it off. So we, we have opportunities for rollout and training. Um, you know, we're talking mouse and keyboard people, so we don't know if we want to give it to give them everything at once or spoon feed them a little bit at a time. We want to have everything live and going and trained for the reporting period in 25. That's in two years. Um, some of these modules will be ready a year before that. So do we want to introduce it to them before that and have them start to upload and get their data in there? I like that approach better, but others like it in one big splash. So yet to be determined. So, and, and I'm not the one deciding that, it's the subject matter experts over each one of those efforts that are getting the pulse of their community to figure out when those are gonna roll out. And there are three different distinct groups. Thank you, any questions? For Keith. For Keith. <laughs> so there's a, a, several chats in here about the excitement about that data, about being excited to see it, we have access it, use it, and so it's resonating with folks. So it's been easy for the federal agencies to per se, this is the data standard for fuels. We haven't done that with the non-federal at all, zero or any, and they've all kind of made up their own standards. So that effort that Chris and his team are going through calling and, and evaluating that, that's a big process. That's a really hard process. Never been done, and they're doing a great job. I mean, that's you see the work, you see the map, that's live data. Um, that's only three months in. So in the way that, you know, on the fire reporting side, NASF has, you know, a, a subset of the data that we require on, or the federal agencies for fire reporting. Are you looking, do you think you're going to take that same type of approach with the fuels or what do you, what do you think in, in that way? I mean, like, and how can, how can we help with standards or any of that type of stuff? So we have. We have worked with, there's lots of players in this field. Um, and there's lots of efforts going on. So we have worked with Henry and the leaders. We have Mindy on our group and him and whoever conversing back and forth about those. And so we've tried, we worked with, uh, we're going to start working with Gabriella on introducing those standards. 
So we'll have to come up with a compromise of what is the minimum data set that is a standard that we should all be talking apples to apples. Um, kind of like we did back with fours. Yeah. Fours effort. I was telling Chris about that well, that was a long time ago. I know. Um, back in and, the day. and then Irwin started that, so now we've got to do that with fuels. It's just an effort that has to be done. So yes, maybe, and sure. <laughs> So, so we are getting some, I, I don't, there are other efforts going on. Uh, Bill and Ira gave lots of money out to lots of organizations. So there's the Ecological Restoration Institutes. There's uh, three of them. They're associated with colleges, uh, Northern Arizona, one in Las Vegas, New Mexico. I don't remember the, I don't remember the name of the college. And then uh, Colorado State. And so the one in uh, New Mexico is called SWERI, S-W-E-R-I. We met with them long, long ago in Boise. I've been communicating with them. So, um, and their study, they received a big chunk of change from the bill uh, money, and they're they're asked to provide a study on the effectiveness of fuel treatments, and then provide that map update every five years um, over time. So that's great. And, but the data that they need is almost identical to what everybody else is doing. So they're investing in some of the work we're doing, and then we'll give them data. Because they, or they would have to do it themselves. And they said, well, it's easier to pay you. Let's not reinvent a new wheel. Let's let you do that. Okay. So we've got some investments there. Uh, we've been working with, we talked a lot with the private burners um, that burn, pl burn planters. They have to call and get like a, uh, a weather approval through, they have to get a weather briefing, an approval every day. And the app can do that for them, and so it might be a process for them to enter their burns and get that approval. It's an easy stop for them, and we get data. So that's some carrot and carrot and stick out there for some. So that's so we're trying to get data from all over the place. So, and are they all the same data standard? Not yet, but I'm up to the challenge. For a couple more years. Yes, at least. Okay, uh, New Mexico Highlands University. That says. Yeah, that's it. Hey, Rochelle, this is Skip. Um, I just want to add something for Keith. Um, since the geospatial community is working on updating that data standard, it might be good to try and pull in someone um, to help out from the state side. Yeah, I second that, Skip. That would be great. Uh, we lost the audio. <laughs> Thanks for accepting. <laughs> Actually, Joe's the chair, so yeah, don't try contact for the JSC. Get in there. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I saw Christy on. So we wanted Christy to give us an update. Hi, Christy about uh, what's going on with the Department of Interior and Warm Fuels work. Um, so just uh, hand it over to Christy. All right, thank you for having me today. Um, so Inform Fuels and Post Fire, um, also known as Next Gen NIFCORS, and, and uh, so glad I got to watch the previous presentation because I've, woven, I've added a few slides to mine clarifying which part of NIFCORS I'm talking about in, in our piece. Um, so that will work. So current approach and workflow for um, Department of the Interior primarily um, for, for fuels management and post-fire reporting. This is a, it will be a fuel-centric um, primarily presentation, but um, I'll talk about post-fire near the end. So uh, this, this center stack, if you will, is the fuels data for Department of Interior. Uh, Forest Service, we did lump in. State systems, we did lump in because we do recognize that they do play in if force to some degree. Um, so for fuels management data, um, NIFCORS is the existing um, tabular data entry point. There is a lat long, as somebody mentioned in the chat, that's um, entered for interior fuels treatments through in NIFCORS, um, and BIA uploads their polygons into NIFCORS. Um, it, it is not 
synchronous. I don't know if that's the right word exactly, but um, it's an after the fact addition of the polygon. And then these down here are the essentially the spatial databases um, that are separate. Um, everybody is tracking their actual polygon data um, after treatments occur and after the data has been entered and completed in NIFT force. So these, these are a distinct database right now for each of the bureaus. Um, and um, states don't actually enter fuels treatment as, as folks were talking about that before, um, what, or what we would typically describe as fuels treatment work into the section of NIFT force that, that the Department of Interior Bureaus work in. Forest Service da um, it, data entry is into facts that data is brought into NIFT force. So those, um, that tabular information is available both for, for both Department of Interior and Forest Service in NIFT force currently. Um, the rest of this is just all the other things that we'd like to connect to, or that eventually, um, once the spatial data is connected to the NIF force data, um, things it flows into those. Um, and then, so that brings us to to current um, a little bit, maybe maybe a quick look back. Um, so, Inform Fuels is our new. Um, application that we will be using to do spatial planning for fuels management and post-fire for Department of Interior Bureaus. Um, and the production environment went live for Fish and Wildlife Service in March. We've done testing for PARC, BIA, and BLM in April and July of this year. And we just finished uh, getting uh, PARC, BIA, and our office into the production system. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the the big deal for us is that you can see the treatments on a map. Um, these are they are squares for those who've worked in informed wildfire reporting uh, that probably looks familiar. I think they're triangles in informed wildfire. So those were from imported data imported from NIFPORS, but again, that's that's point data, lat longs, as well as the acres for those proposed treatments. Um, the other thing, these these yellow circle that you can see here is a what we described as an activity. Um, some of those will be points as as they were previously, and but most of those will also be polygons, uh, which is new treatments and activities. The difference is important in the fuels world. In IA for Department of Interior, treatments are things that happen on the ground, things that we normally talk about for fuels. Activities are things that um, support implementation or monitor after treatments, essentially. They're, they're non-ground disturbing actions um, that we fund or pay for through fuel, fuels funding to ensure that work gets done. Um, and this is just a nice example where you can see some work that's planned on the Colville Reservation. This is a park service unit up here along the river. Um, and then this is a fish and wildlife service um, boundary over here. So that spatial, that map provides that opportunity to work and coordinate across boundaries. Um, and so this is a, a place for us to do that. Um, so looking forward a little bit, our deadline for out year planning, FY24, um, for, for Fed starts on October 1. So um, program of work for FY24 is due at the end of this week. Um, for the three bureaus that have gone in, um, that's this Friday. We've made some adjustments as many who are present or as um, th there are some hiccups moving to a new system. So we're trying to be flexible on that date if, if necessary. But it's important because on October 1, we will turn the corner, so to speak, and be able to actually start to report on actual accomplished treatments in informed fuels um, from Department of, for the Department of Interior Bureaus. Um, so what a lot of folks think of as our fuels work will, will begin to be available on October 1, assuming that work has gotten done. Um, then in... Um, by November 1, we're looking to bring in incomplete work from FY20, FY23 and earlier. Um, also bring that into Inform Fuels so that accomplishments can be um, reported on things that were planned and funded in a previous year and, and moving forward. And then um, October 15th of this year, we will we'll wrap up for those three bureaus um, reporting in NIFBORS. That'll be the last um, I would um, entry into NIF course for those folks. Um, BLM is on a little bit different timeline. Um, things didn't quite work out for them, so they they're backed up 
a full year, essentially. Um, we do hope to bring in their out-year data in the spring of 24 um, so that they can begin reporting actual accomplishments in um, the fall of FY25. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's very similar. Um, so post-fire, um, we're starting to work on we're starting to think about post-fire. We haven't started any construction. Um, refining the requirements in October, hopefully begin construction in November and have the first bureau testing in uh, January. Based on how things have gone with fuels, we may try to do something a little more condensed. Um, the, the time frame from October to transition in October, Last year, testing in August uh, to transition in October has has been challenging for for folks. Um, and then probably some things, maybe hopefully some things that maybe you all care about a little bit more. Um, so this week we are testing with folks. Um, we brought in the WIF data service um, to test. There's no real data there at this point, but um, and we've added the ability to copy spatial data from these legacy treatments. So this on the this screen grab are legacy treatments. There's the squares that um, are current plan treatments. WIFS treatments aren't here because this particular spot didn't have any, but that the ability for users to create data, do mobile data collection, um, those sorts of things, do more complex geospatial editing, um, can use that WIFS data service to create that information, and then they can copy the treatments um, or the geospatial data um, into informed fuels. Um, for completed treatments, it'll copy the, the completed, the required completed fields for Department of Interior. For estimated or planned treatments, it'll only copy the, the geospatial data at this point. Um, we are working to publish a publicly available um, data service, geospatial data service, by October 1 on the NIFC open data site. Um, and we are working on the metadata uh, to go along with that right now. Um, in addition, probably longer term and separate from, or in addition to, I should say, uh, the, the NWCG data standard, we're also looking at developing a DOI data standard that will support um, consistent understanding and communication of what DOI's requirements are for fuels management and post-fire data. And that's actually all that I have today. Are there any questions? So I think, you know, um, well, while the new informed fuels is really specific to DOI, I think it's important that we, you know, continue to kind of keep our eyes on the fact that there's a lot of moving parts and, uh, and what we keep trying to do through these conversations that we have as a group and the folks that are participating in this, so like Skip's group, I mean, we're, we're, we're making incremental movements towards being able to really tie this data together, have two-way data sharing, be able to start answering some questions and visualizing some information that has been a real struggle for us in the past. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's just a matter of wanting to keep everybody up to date on this so while you may not necessarily be a fuel specialist sitting in the room, um, if you look at it from the data perspective, which is what we're all here for, right? It's it's there's all where we continue to make progress. And I think that that's an important thing for us to think about and to look at and to think about how we continue to coordinate, right? Like there's value in these conversations. And I'm sure that from these conversations, there's going to be a whole bunch of, hey, I need to talk to you and let's get together. And because I didn't realize you were doing this or I didn't realize where you were at with this, but this is a similar problem that we're trying to solve or this is what we're doing, right? Let's coordinate. And so that's that's part of what we want to try and accomplish here is that type of activity as well. So. All right. Break time with so Christy. Thank you for joining Larry us. has a question. Oh, we got a question, Steve. Well, well, kind of more just an observation, but you know, I kind of was listening to the way uh, Christy described uh, that business line, which is not one that I'm super familiar with. 
But I guess I'm just kind of wondering at the at the national data management level. I mean, we're 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 kind of getting to the point where we're all talking to each other enough that these kind of disturbances to the landscape, using Christie's words, you know, can be can be different kinds. And we've never really sat down and said, hey, you know, that's a wildfire disturbance, that's a fuels treatment disturbance in the form of a mechanical treatment, or that's a fuels treatment disturbance in the form of broadcast broadcast burn, or that's a post fire activity, you know, that involves seeding. But I guess, Rochelle, I'm, I'm starting to see an opportunity for us to maybe classify all these disturbances in a way that, you know, across the business lines, you know, we've got some consistency, you know, create basically a domain of disturbances, if you will, that makes sense, you know, given the granularity of our management compartments or, you know, just the way the data is available to us in the spatial realm. Yeah, I, I I love when you're on the call with us, Steve, because you always have such great ideas. And and again, I think that this is a reflection of our maturing in the community and starting to go, oh, well, this data, we actually there's there's overlap, right? And and so we start understanding it a little bit differently. But yeah, I think that's great. I mean, let's Let's talk about that and see what that might mean. Keith, you were you had a grin on your face. What was that about? Well, I, when Steve described that, I said, man, I want in on that action. Describe oh, our, di our disturbances. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're only going to destroy disturbances on the ground. <laughs> and, then, and then Emmy, you know. Domain of disturbances. <laughs> There's an acronym, a DOD, a, a different meaning of DOD. <laughs> wow. Feel like, feel like, feel like though, this has been sort of bubbling up for a couple of years. I, yeah, I think it has too. I don't feel it. I feel like it's been this sort of waiting game till everyone's on the same page because this is all part of this whole. I need that, you need that, and I want that. And there's a relation between that and these relationships that we're building, et cetera. And they're all so tightly coupled. And I, I'm, I'm glad that there's light bulbs going on for other people because I feel like that we've been talking about this just. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I, I think we, it's a, it's a reflection of when we think about data, right? You can, data is, it, it's a layer of our business but it affords us opportunities to think a little bit differently. And so we've tended to get really uh, stuck in like, how, how, where does this business function sit? How, how is it funded? And I think it was, you know, we, we ran into this when we did the line of business work with WIFID back in the day, right? Because it was like, we were trying to do it based on funding line and it was like, but from a data perspective, that is like not like makes no sense at all because you use the same data in multiple funding streams. And so it's like it, it's just different ways to kind of slice and dice and categorize and think about data. And then the thing about that is that then we can say, OK, well, if we think of all of this as a disturbance, is there a way to manage the data about disturbances that instead of having separate things, maybe it's all one thing, right? Like it just gives us different ways to start thinking about how we want to manage the data in the future, how to make it more usable. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's great. Let's create a band and um, make it happen. So maybe with her I think the up. next thing is to do a, whatever an icon <laughs> descriptor. Was. Do a logo for, do a logo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The domain of disturbances. Opening from Metallica. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? Somebody actually told me that they, their family, oh, I think it was one of my friends was saying that over the years, their family has a list of great band names that they've collected. And so whenever something like this comes up, they add it to their list. I'll have to, I'll have to give her this It's one. not really a band, but we're going to make it a band. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see, we've got another hand up. Amanda. Um, from Amanda. Hey, can you hear me all right? Yeah. 
Oh, great. Well, Christy, thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a quick question about the the legacy implementation you're talking about on November 1st. Um, you're going to start pulling in 2023 and in prior years data. Is there any rollout plan for that? Is that going to kind of be like a a one stop implementation into Inform, or are you going to roll out like year by year? So I might need to clarify. Um, so current, because we've been working seamlessly in NIFBORS for literally decades, um, carry bureaus have, and I, I have to laugh at um, states, it's easy on the Fed side. I, I'm not sure it is. Um, bureaus have been doing carryover um, processes differently. We're going to have a, a pretty set carryover process um, for department for the bureaus or we plan to um, so that we can bring all of their incomplete work from NIFCORs over it in, into inform all of their future planned work is for the three bureaus has been brought over already so this is just anything that they, they thought they were going to get done in FY23 which ends on October 1 um, or September 31st um, will be brought over into inform on November 1st. We just have to get a little bit of time to get settled into um, inform with the data that's already there, get the other data transformed and, and uploaded. So that, did I answer your question? Okay, so to clarify, you're, and I'm new to the treatment world, so forgive me if I'm misspeaking here. Completed treatments that happened in the past won't be carried over. It's only things that were planned in 2023 that didn't occur. Essentially, yes. Um, okay. So the that legacy, the uh, the last slide that I showed that had those dark polygons, those are the those are the legacy treatments of the historic completed treatments, previously completed treatments. That in you can't really interact with that information to do summary reports on it or anything like that at this point. Um, that is another discussion that we have going on with Rochelle at all is bringing the legacy, the old completed stuff that was in NIFCORS um, into a space that, that you can interact with the informed data as the, the new um, informed completed treatments and the old um, completed treatment information from NIFCORS. Um, and so maybe for the, the national fuels effort um, might help with some of that as well. So possibly not solved yet. Okay, thanks for seeing. And then one other thing I had is, um, I know that your, mass, your last uh, mention was creating a DOI standard. Um, so we're, Skip, um, Susan, Andrew, uh, a bunch of, of Julie, I'm probably forgetting a bunch of folks, um, are working on creating that NWCG standard. Um, and we'd love your input early on um, so that maybe things that are incorporated or you're thinking about incorporating in the DOI standard can go ahead and be thrown in one um, so that we don't, don't. I mean, maybe you don't even need a DOI standard. We could include everything in the interagency one. Um, so I don't think I'll, so. I'll, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> it, I think and we can talk ours needs a lot, too. Yeah, I think ours needs a lot more detail. Um, okay. I, I think that's that's the reason why. So the end of existing WCG standard is actually really pretty good. Um, I think ours has a lot more detail, and that's where um, we we want to honor that NWCG process to provide something that works for all the agencies, member agencies for NWCG, and have something that has additional details for for our for our purposes. Okay. So. All right. Cool. Well, regardless, yeah. I think as we put that standard together, we'd love to have you look at it. So awesome. Um, we'll talk offline about it. Thanks, Christy. I appreciate it. You bet. I'll quickly add to that, Christy. Um, I'm, I'm chairing that on GSC, so we will send you the draft standard where we have it ready, um, which I'm, I'm hoping after the next meeting we'll have a draft standard ready to go. And then I want to make sure I close this loop with SWERI and a national standard. So um, I understand what you're saying, Christy, about DOI needing a more complete standard. Um, that makes sense to me. So I, I see what we are doing in GSC as kind of a sub set of those fields um, that we want to standardize. And I want to make sure we're roping in what SWERI is doing with a national fuel standard. So um, is it Chris, Chris, Chris Grecker? Would, would I contact you? Um, can I send you our draft standard? Can you send us your draft standard? Um, I'd sure like to kind of dovetail these things together a little bit so that these, you know, we've all seen these crosswalks of these fuel standards and their ugly spreadsheets. And, and I want to make those simpler. 
<laughs> not so ugly. Um, so that's my comment is just reach out to me because I want to make sure I'm inclusive as we develop the standard. Okay. Well, I think we are back on schedule. Pretty close. So, um, yeah, still just a little bit ahead, but let's take a 15 minute break and we'll come back, uh, jump into the business knowledge and trends with Chris and Lauren, and then we'll start getting ready for dinner tonight. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Christy. <laughs> Carrie is our chief data officer, and uh, she and I have a We've been working to gather up uh, resources in a small team and trying to increase, increase some capacity at an enterprise level uh, in all things data in the Forest Service. Forest Service has had data management uh, you know, efforts and initiatives and you know, centers of excellence going on all over the place for a long time, but that kind of the strings to pull it all together, tie it all together and talk about some of the things that I think you're used to dealing with and talking about as you know, natively interoperable you know function um, we're not as mature i would say in that sense we've been operating in a very decentralized manner for a long time so um, not only is the cdo fairly new in the forest service but we also have a new cto chief technology office and of course they're focused on the technology side and um, it uh, stuff and obviously there's a connection between our data side and the and the technology side, but there's also you know, the third thing, which is kind of the business focus, the business, the business itself, and understanding that and how we take that and translate it into the technology, the applications, and the data, all of that that we've been talking about. So this presentation is part of a journey we've been on. I've, I started down this path about four or five months ago, maybe six months, um, and it's really very business focused. So trying to take the all of the data stuff and IT uh, terms and, and the jargon that we all know and use, especially here uh, in, in IT settings, and, and back up a little bit and say, well, how, how does the business talk? You know, how do they communicate their business? And so uh, the, there was a book that was recommended to me. I read that book and it was just like, wow, there's some really cool stuff in here. And, um, and so that's uh, evolved into an exploration, a journey we're on to see where we can take this and how it then can tie into our data and technology systems. Um, introduced it to Rochelle and her team and Lauren here is going to help me present today. Uh, and, we're, and we're still exploring it. Um, there's some great ideas in it. I'll invite Lauren and Rochelle, of course, to, to jump in at any point in this. So um, go ahead to the next one, please. Uh, so I just realized, I don't, hopefully some people can read this, but I'll, I'll read some of it to you. So the, this book is called Business Models Blueprints, Enabling Your Data to Speak the Language of Business. So um, there's a couple of quotes in here that I love. I put the one at the bottom uh, uh, is a pretty important one. Data has to speak for itself because there may not always be a person there uh, that can explain the data, especially as our data assets grow and grow. More and more people, um, you know, it's got to have embedded in it that, that contextual meaning so that you don't have to have somebody explaining this stuff to you all the time. So data has to speak for itself. Um, and I really like that it is framed in the book as data as a as, uh, business communication, right? Baked into your beta, it, data is a message or a story. Um, and Again, we're not always going to be there, especially into the future, and we all are, are retired and we're gone. Uh, that data still needs to be able to, to speak or communicate to whoever else is reading or getting information back out of, the, uh, out of that data. So it's really a communication. And they frame it as like language and, and 
like we would communicate with one another. And how does the business do that, right? We have our language, but the fuels management program has their language. Fire suppression has their language. Recreation has their language, et cetera, on and on. They'll have their special language. And we need to understand what that is. The data needs to have that faith in somehow. Um, so the act of creating data is the act of creating a message to people in the future. The quality of data in a data system architecture can never be any better than the quality of the business communication that produced it. So that's really foundational. I think it's kind of core understanding that. Next slide, please. So Laura and I brainstormed a little bit, just a, a quick and dirty example. Um, and uh, the word, I won't say this, in, I won't say it, ambiguity. Uh, there is a pain point in the Forest Service, uh, and there probably is with the interagency fire community of, of terms that are ambiguous. And, and perhaps agency is one of those. Um, you know, what, it, what, what kind of agency? A host agency, jurisdictional, responsible, uh, may all be slightly different. So when you use the word agency, you can't assume that it's, there's just one agency and it means the same. And we have that, for example, in the Forest Service, act, the word activity. Um, you know, the, the planning folks have in their mind a certain thing when they say activity, but the, the, the activity reporting systems have a different kind of idea of what activity is. And, but I think people talk together and they just kind of assume, oh, my activity is the same as yours. So uh, that's an example. Next slide, please. So some of the business drivers with the why, behind it, hopefully it's already started to kind of outline that, but really to optimize communication. So we, we're all talking the same and your, dang, your, your data is communicating uh, in a clear way. Um, it's really into this, this model or methodology is intended to be something that the business owns, you know, and, and, and it's theirs, it's in their language, they maintain it, uh, and they use that as a tool to work with the data folks, to work with the technologists to implement something in a technology stack. Of course, it you know, leads to the other, but it, it can also stand alone. A biz, you're capturing your business knowledge in a system, a repository, is helpful for you people coming on, you know, the, the acronym, you know, library there, you know, for a new person who hasn't heard all this alphabet soup, there's a system that's capturing this and, and you can you can transfer that knowledge, that knowledge of what these abbreviations mean. mean. So it helps uh, outside of the technology altogether, just communicating with the next generation of business folks. Um, so a smooth aggregation is part of this, like if, uh, it's the apple, the classic apples, the oranges, if you're using a, a term and it means different things, but you're trying to put it together because it's the same word, you could be having, you know, aggregation could be meaningless or, or your meaning is compromised. And improving data quality, if the data itself is aligned to your business and their rules and their definitions, that's, that's really getting that data quality. You're communicating effectively. Getting the right message. Excellent. Oh. And one more thing on that, that improving the data quality, we, what, what seems to be happening is, is an event occurs and it will generate data and we store that data. And then down the road, we end up going back and having to clean up that data after it's been generated. So if we've got consistent business processes, in place that are via the business rules are standardizing the happening of that event, then that is is going to increase our data quality because it's going to reduce the need for us to have to go clean up messed up data in the first place. And that was one of the the things reading through that book that you know you said different ones jumped out at you. That was one of the ones that jumped out at me was that concept. I'm just going to go through this one real quick. I think you can put the pieces together, but business, I, I think this this group I've heard use the term business often and they understand what that means, but going to a recreation person in the forest, if they say business, they think, oh, we don't sell things or we don't build things. Just making that little distinction, business is kind of like programs in the forest service or BLM or DOI. It's, it's, it's the different areas that we work in, including fire and 
uh, fuels management, et cetera. Knowledge, of course, a knowledge uh, is, you know, what we're, what, especially knowledge related to our business. It's in our heads a lot of times, but we don't necessarily want them to be uh, squirreled away just in our heads or in somebody's file cabinet. And then blueprint, I think you're all kind of hopefully have a good visual. It's, it's kind of like a map or a picture, a, a visual that helps you understand that knowledge. So that's next slide. The caveat here with the rest of these slides is that I built this uh, this slide deck uh, for an audience. It's not they aren't data people, not IT people. It was the business people, so I wanted to keep it really simple. Um, and I think all of you, have, like you know, could go way deeper into the, into these concepts or ideas with us on this journey. But uh, the business knowledge blueprint uh, simply is kind of got a, four, a couple of components to it: a concept or a term and the name of that term and a concept definition, which put those two together and you've got your glossary, which you all are, are building out in Edge right now. So you're already on your way to a business knowledge blueprint um, system. In addition to that, the, uh, the blueprints contain examples because sometimes the definition alone is not quite enough for you to really grasp it. So a few examples built in there. Gabrielle, jump in anytime you want. Okay. You want to <laughs> Um, so examples are part of it, and then the business rules, which I've been hearing, uh, you know, various at various points, defining and understanding our business rules are important too as well. So that's part. That's the blueprint there, and it, and part of it's kind of graphical, the way you can model it out uh, in the book. Uh, part of it's like the, the just the textual description or the definition, but those are kind of the core ideas behind a blueprint. So the simple example, in case you can't read it, is for uh, uh, travel management, and that's an engineering function that's in the Forest Service. So how we, how we you know use our roads and trail systems, and some of the terms: motor vehicle, motorcycle, motor vehicle use map, route, trail, road. I didn't put on there, but those are terms that you would want to define. Uh, you would want to give examples so people who weren't sure what a route was or didn't exactly know how a trail was defined, you know, what's the difference between a road and a trail, when does it become one or the other? Um, so those are some terms. Next slide, please. And then you can uh, you can get into the some uh, de definitions of those terms. And these were pulled out of uh, Direct Force of Directives Manual and Handbook, and they're not always written in the most clear way. So there's a, I think that we're gonna have to learn how to take definitions that are scattered all over our, our policy and maybe figure out how to simplify them or be more distilled and less ambiguous. But um, I think that's part of the part of the process of learning. You know, as we go through this process, learning how to write a good definition that it isn't too busy, it doesn't have too much stuff in it, just really distilled down. Uh, but anyway, there's some definitions. We need to read them. Next slide, please. Funny because it's data management, data stand terminology board. We got a request for truck trail. Remember that? <laughs> Truck trail? Truck trail. Someone was like, that's a road. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a two-wheel truck. No, I think it was road. Road road. Truck trail. Sea road. <laughs> sea road. Sea road. That's a road. <laughs> <laughs> that's a road. Nice topic. So I think so. Rules and examples in this case: a rule might be motor vehicles may not operate on a specific route unless allowed by the motor vehicle use map. Example: uh, according to 2020-22 MVM motor vehicle use map, motorcycles may operate on Trail 5019 on the Manti LaSalle National Forest. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a question? Yeah. 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 No. Sorry. Sorry. No worries. Um, so, so giving an example that you can kind of chew on. My lines disappeared. A line disappeared. There's a line. It, here, it, it's, here. <laughs> here. Yeah, just, just, it's washed out. Just, just pretend it's there. <laughs> so again, they, they, they outline a way which uh, often is useful for people to have a visual uh, of what, what all this is. I just, just showed in text, except the definition. Um, and this builds out 
for example, that there's a hierarchy that you know roads and trails are 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 set subsets of a route. They're a kind of route. And so it's shown in a visual way that those are kind of related. Um, and then, for example, you can build uh, uh, a, a uh, what they call a verb. Basically, we're building a sentence in a way, uh, actually, uh, where this object, this term, the MVA motor vehicle use map, has a relationship to motor vehicles in that an MVM allows or authorizes a motor vehicle to operate on a road or trail. And so you can actually, you know, that's a graphic way of writing a sentence, again, communicating in a language your business, uh, your travel management business. Next slide, please. So a more, uh, a, a little more of a, a, a deeper example here is a library, a library model. So you have concepts or terms like you have a library card, a library, you have books in the library, library, etc. So those are some, you know, nouns or, or things related to a library. And then you have these relationships. So a book is owned by a library. Um, a, a librarian works for a library. So here these business rules can be spelled out either have it in graphic form or in, uh, in written form. I think if you go to the next one, it will highlight some of these. It is just not on the screen. It's you can't see it. Okay. <laughs> you can't see it. Uh, so yeah, for example, a library card may be used to check out a book. Library card uh, is used to go on across the top is used to check out a book down here. There's a subject, uh, an ob a verb and an object, just like every sentence. Only if the book is owned by a library for which the card is authorized. So there you're, you're putting these connections together into a rule um, that can then be used to build out a data system that tracks all this stuff uh, and a technology that helps you to manage it. And in the corner, you see the legend noun verb and categories. Go to the next slide, please. Oh, I zipped right through them. So I know Lauren has got another example that she's going to show in just a second, but um, that's that's uh, it at a really high level or, or kind of general level. We're still learning the methodology. Uh, we've engaged uh, some subject matter experts in the planning, DEPA planning shop and forest service. They're interested in working with us on a concept model or business knowledge blueprint. And so we're in the process of taking that next step to learn the methodology, how to build these, where to build them, I think a tool like Edge would be an important repository for, for building these things, but we're still at that stage of, okay, now what can we do with this and where does it, where does it go from here? Um, but there's some discussion questions here. If we wanted to, to talk a little bit more about this, you're curious about it. Uh, you know, I'm always interested in, in ambiguous terms that you may have, you're wrestling with, um, and, uh, just to have thoughts about how this can help us with our data stewardship challenges. But before we go into the discussion, I'm going to let Lauren take over and talk a little bit about a more specific example you might be able to relate to. If you can back up to that, the, the slide, the meeting that, or the, um, the, the road that book did that is pretty useful compared to my thing that looks like it's something out of Alice's restaurant. So um, one of the things that is really, really cool about this, this whole concept model where you draw it out is because of the way that they mapped it out with the phrases where they've got your, your noun concepts as your items that you define, and then you've got your verb concepts as the connectors that are in between, and then they're taking that noun and verb Part, and they're building it into what your business rule is. So, it, so it, it's almost kind of like if you can get it mapped out right, and if you can figure out what your flow is and get it labeled correctly, it helps you write your business rule. So I figured since Gabriella really got the definitions part off and running, I didn't see any reason to reinvent the wheel there when I was trying to figure out how to work with this and, and, and learn a little bit more about it and play with the concept in relationship to an action or a process, a business process that we already have. 
So I, I, I didn't spend a lot of time defining things. Therefore, in my example, I know what these things will mean. You may or may not, but in, in the real world, they would need to be defined so that everybody would know rather than just having something moving in my head. So that's kind of my disclaimer here. So, um, and my little, Alice's restaurant diagram. I took the return. Oh, that's Alice. That's Alice. <laughs> okay. Let's 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 see if Lori can learn how to share her screen correctly to where everybody can feel it. Because there's an extra button here. You got to click. Yep. There we go. Muy bueno. And total operator error there. Sorry about that. Um. I took the, the process, I, I took something that I was already really familiar with because I, I, I came here most recently from dealing with ICBS, which is the cash management program, and it's working with the cash community. So what I'm, I'm detailing here is when something gets returned to a cash from a fire, kind of what the process is that it goes through that ultimately ends up affecting the cost of the incident because there's there's a definite business process there and i figured if i picked something that i already knew the definitions of and kind of ran with it maybe i could start getting these actions defined clear enough that i could actually come up with a business rule so um up here at the very top the cash receives the items the truck backs up they open the doors they kick all this stuff out onto the ramp they leave so the the first thing that the cash is going to need to be doing is they're going to need to be sorting these things into things that are consumable and things that are durable the consumables are things like those canteens that go out the lips have touched and mres and batteries and then durable would be like hose clothing chainsaws things like that so on the consumables if if a consumable We've got cash sorts item, item is consumable, condition is RFI, and that makes stands, definition in my head, it stands for ready for issue. That means it's unopened, it's clean, it's new, you can put it back on the shelf and you can go use it again. So the batteries, the MREs that were never touched, canteens that were never opened. And that will go down and it will generate credit because it's ready to go again. And the credit will deduct from the incident cost. So it's cheaper. And then on the consumable side where the canteen got used, that's not ready for issue. We throw it away in the trash and it's a loss and it adds to the incident cost. So that's basically how consumables work. They're, they're, they're pretty simple, they're pretty easy. And then where it starts getting more complicated is with your durable goods. So your durable goods, again, are they ready for issue? If they are, then progress to, it's gonna make it to where the incident doesn't cost as much because they go right back on the shelf. But for your non-returnables or your non-ready um, for issue ones, they have to be processed in order to make them usable again. So they'll, they'll weed out what is unserviceable, the chainsaw that got ran over and is completely destroyed. Um, which will <laughs> generate a loss that will add to the incident cost. Or they will go ahead and take the items that are going to be re refurbished and cleaned up and made into serviceable items again. And they'll put them on a work order. And that work order is how they still tie to the incident so that the incident still gets charged rather than just anybody else because this refurbishment may not even happen at the cash where all this junk got dumped off. It might be snowing and it's a whole bunch of dirty, nasty hose. So they're going to put it all somewhere. They're, they might ship it down to, you know, if this is Missoula, they might ship it to Prescott because Prescott's got hot and sunny weather and they got a bunch of bored people and they can clean that hose. So it, it, it's the only way to be <laughs> tied to this incident is by having those goods, um, bonded in with that work order so that it, it, it keeps them associated with it. So now they're going into the refurbishment process 
and various things will happen. Um, dirty, nasty clothes will go off to one of the caches that has a contract with a laundry facility. This caches don't wash all this stuff themselves. They'll, they'll go ahead and get those clothes laundered through the contract. Um, if it's pumps or saws, um, depending on the cash that was involved, they might or might not have a small engine shop, so they might need to ship those things off to get new sprockets, chains, carburetors, 50 gazillion different little parts. Anyways, they'll go through this refurbishment process and they'll track the, the things that get used in that refurbishment process on that work order. And so items used in this process usually are single use items, not always, but usually. It might be the, the wedge that holds the new handle onto the Pulaski when they put that in there, or it, it could even be just shop rags, or it could be new gaskets and the valves. But they'll, um, they'll, they'll track the costs of those things on that. And then when they're all done, and the item's condition is back to RFI, then the incident will have the cost of the refurbished item um, deducted, but the cost of the things to make the refurbished item, like those rags, the saw wedge, the, the gasket, are gonna be added to the incident cost because they were part of the cost of refurbishing it. So at the end, you have different actions that will come to a deducts from the incident cost and then adds to the incident cost. And through all of this, and I still haven't really sorted out how to word this to where it like makes a rule. There's, there's probably other books. Maybe when the guy gives a class, I'll, I'll pick that up. But what I got out of it was the incident cost equals the value of the returns minus the durable item refur refurbishment costs, the loss of used consumables and unserviceable durable items. And it's a little awkward wording, but I was looking at, they had a rule structure that was a, it, it was in a separate handout that was associated with the book that had a template for computation rules for a must be computed as. And I put, okay, well, like, here's an example, kit cost must be computed as some of the cost of all its components, which by the way is exactly how kits are priced out in ICBS. And then you can also use the equal sign as a shorthand, so kit cost equals sum. And that's my translation of my Alice's restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to really cut costs, you could get rid of those crappy um, water bottles and use better ones and then wash them. <laughs> Consumables are probably where you lose your money. Um, and they've got, I don't know. And they've got various ways of processing some stuff. It, and now I'm, I'm going to go back to Beth Gray, Gray Cloud's statement, movie, not a documentary. And, and this is accurate, but I, 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 I didn't go into as many details. Like over here, a lot of what they do with consumables in order uh, like the, uh, recycling and um, it, it was it was something that Chris actually asked me asked me about and it was like so so they just throw them away and I was like well no here's a process that they go through to make this a little bit more cost effective. Well they throw away a ton of ice for no reason. I don't like battery waste but that's let's not get stuck on like <laughs> no but I'm just saying like it seems like Cost decisions based on this, it's really useful. And the refurbishment is actually really, really interesting as far as um, when they do transfers from cash to cash to do refurbishment. Because it, it it made sense to me immediately as a firefighter for it, it's raining down in Arizona and it's burning in Montana. So why don't you take all the pumps and the chainsaws and all the cool stuff that Arizona's got in their cash right now, throw it in a truck and take it to Montana so that we can send it out on the fire line instead of going and buying new stuff, which is the only other way you're going to restock the Montana cash. You just got depleted by the last three team orders. So, so that made sense to me. But 
when I first walked in and, and they were like, yeah, so we're, we'll just ship that, that refurbishment elsewhere. And I'm like, why? Why on earth would you want to do that? And then that's when I learned that there were a lot of different factors involved. There was the, the, the contracts for the laundry facilities. There was the, do they even have a small engine shop? Because of course I was spoiled. I came from Alaska. Alaska has everything because they have to. It's their way up there. But um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. And then I was like, so how do you make sure the right incident actually gets charged? Because that's going to matter from a data perspective as well as from a physical one. And it's because it's tied to that work order and, and all the, the shipping around and transferring that they do. And so when I would try to help chase down data inconsistencies that resulted in billing errors, because there's a lot of people that really get excited about these fire costs, that's when I learned that a, a consistent description of the process and a consistent pattern of action by the caches in processing this would result in the consistent data that would give me actual accurate costs when all these money people started asking me about stuff that I had no real clue about but knew I needed to find the answers. So what, what I think is cool about what was going on with this diagram and as Laura's describing it is that this this thing that she drew got, got some conversation going about the business. Like, why do we do this? Or I, why do we throw the batteries away? It should be, and you know that that dialogue there can uh, affect this diagram. We can. It's a tool for the business to sit down and talk about why do we do that. Oh, I, I didn't know that little box up there was doing this. I didn't know that was the decision. So you're talking about that. You're evolving your business. And, and we weren't even talking about data or applications or anything. We were just talking about the business. Um, but, but I think that once you have that kind of lined out, now she's got a rule down there that you know, looks to me like it could be built into a you know, calculation that's in an application or some, some IT system. So you can use this stuff to then start to implement a technology, a solution, a data model, this, that, that, this that's rule, kind of the point of that. Yes. Yeah. This rule is actually built to one of their cognizance reports that they use the, for the, the fire loss use. So, pleasure. so does region one still do standard refurb costs instead of this? Or did they finally come around to this? And for everybody that doesn't know standard refurb costs, is the Zula as they a cost for a week uh, chainsaw kit and say they charge an incident a hundred dollars to refurb it and they charge a hundred dollars if they just have to open it and oil the chainsaw or they charge it a hundred dollars if it's trash and yeah so i'm gonna so i'm gonna because i want to keep us focused on like this is a tool because we're not really the business that's going to make the decision about whether or how that gets done, right? But that's been a big, huge, they had a big battle and the zoo had to go up and, and prove that it was legal for them to do that. So they have done their returns and refurbishes different. So it doesn't follow that model. Well, and that's, and then, so the thing is that then you, you have to look at how you use that understanding to build the business rules to represent the fact that Missoula may do it differently than everybody else, right? And so, mm -hmm. so it's it's capturing those, this is all about understanding the business so we could make good data and IT decisions. Yeah. So and the other this is how ICDS works. So if they're using anything that was issued via, via ICDS to IROC and they're, they're processing the return, this is their option. They do not have the option to just, no, I'll just pre type in 100 bucks. So they'll, if, if, if they're using this system, that's the choice. Now, I don't know, maybe they're doing some stuff that's outside. It, it's not every cache out there is in ICDS. Um, for example, in Alaska, the, the state of Alaska is not in ICDS, and so they, they've had to. to work out agreements with the BLM so that how they share 
their their inventory and and but a lot of their processes are completely different and that's that's not part of my world here to address in, in this this little section it would it would be a business process that the cash community should address but like you said that's that's on them that's my former job that's i can stand there and tell them that but it won't be me so i'm over here now off the ball question this is what they do but do you find do the cash is still hoard items Okay, so we're going to stop. <laughs> so, do just do shops? Do, 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 do IT shops? So, do IT shops? So, so should we go back to the questions that you had, Chris? We can do that, but I was going to ask you, Rochelle, since you've kind of been in the, the middle of our, our investigations in the book, is there a, a vision that you would, that you kind of have in your mind for relevance or application or, or where you might see this going with with the, the data community or the interagency fire community? Yeah, you know, I think I, I think some of the things that I've seen uh, Gabriella start doing with implementing some of this with our definitions has been really helpful. And we, what, you know, it's, what, what we, once we started reading this, right, and kind of thinking about the principles that are, sh that are shared in this um, book, it allowed us to start looking at definitions that, you know, were like a paragraph, right? We had a we had a term and we had a definition. We had a paragraph that was the definition, because what we were doing was inserting business rules and exerting examples, and what that did is it made it really difficult to actually use the definition in a meaningful way. And so when she stripped out the examples, stripped out the business rules, and just had a definition that defined something, but then we had a way to add the examples, add the business rules, then it becomes more usable, right? And that's really what we're trying to get to is, do we know what we're talking about, first of all? Do we all understand that this is the concept we're talking about and what it means, and then, examples help us understand that and then we can start building out these business rules so for me i want to get to the business rules <laughs> but we kind of have to go through a process to get there right and by but but those business rules are what become really meaningful for us in understanding the data and building ibme and all of those all of those uh pipelines that mike was showing us yesterday right those are all based on business rules. So we've got to have the business tell us what their rules are. We have to be able to capture those in a way that we can access them and use them, and then we can apply them in our applications. And so that's that's really, I, I got excited because I think we have had a tendency in the past to, to mush things together and that idea of create the resolving ambiguity. This was a, a model, a, a method for us to do that. And I think back to my old boss, Roy Johnson, who used to say, all models are wrong, some are useful. And I think that's, this is a model, right? But if we're consistent, and I especially like the idea that we might actually be consistent within Forest Service and DOI, and the interagency well and fire program is like uh, super exciting to me that to help promote that understanding and that engagement uh, from the business. So. And I think one of the big takeaways on on these types of models is it it should be technology agnostic. This is this is our process. While while you were diagramming what ICBS does, and and that's our our frame of reference. How does a resource get ordered? we would probably diagram out real quickly what IROC's doing. But then as you, you walk through it, it really should be what should our process be to inform that tool. And then as technology progresses, that, that process still holds true. We can just maybe do it easier. Yeah, because even when I was doing my diagram, um, which actually started with bunch of stuff on sticky notes that I started on my, my sticky wall, but I outgrew my sticky wall. So then it, it became my sticky sliding glass door. 
and I was moving everything around to diagram what I knew the process was, I suddenly ended up with a bunch of questions about, so, so why would we be doing this? Because when you're looking at it from this perspective, all of a sudden it makes a lot more sense to be asking about, well, perhaps we could do this instead. And, and even just when I had this up there, Emmy saw a few things that could be tuned up. So it, it's, it, 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 what the value of the concept I thought um, that, that I kind of got out of this was that it really helped make you think about how you're defining your business rules, which are ultimately going to be providing you with your, your business, with, with your data. Um, um, so, sorry, I just want to add to that. Documenting the business is like the edge, and then there's a uh, mm -hmm. business catalog. You actually yeah. have to document that. So, no matter how technology changed, our yeah. mission did not change that much. The things we do didn't change that much. You know, and the requirements, it's majority stays. So, when you document that, mm -hmm. That like the project I did for the we did just did for that CUI marking and the half of the effort is to go trying to find out of what is the business rule make this data sensitive or if this is data sensitive or not that impact any business uh, rules or requirements. So I find that if we have a, a place to document that and it's shared. And as a reference, as a, you know, supporting evidence, that would be super cool. And it's documented for other people too, yeah. because if you, for example, won the lottery tonight and tomorrow you call in too rich to work ever again and you go off, then <laughs> all of the knowledge that you have in your head that was related to this process is still documented in the database for all of us non-lottery winners to go and still be able to use when we need to be able to, to, to make the process work correctly. So Steve, Steve Larrabee asked um, a question. And, and so where we would, because we have Edge, and because Edge is a graph database, and what this author is really talking about if our ontologies, then, you know, this is just a, a this is the business way of talking about ontologies without using the word ontology, but edge is really designed to handle all of that. So being able to capture those concepts and the definitions and the examples and the business rules are built in edge out of the box. And so we don't even really have to like do a lot of stuff to be able to capture that. So again, it's just a, it's, it's why we got like Gabriella and, I got super excited when we first saw this and my Don and, and Lauren have also been excited and Jill is that, you know, it it takes what we've been wanting to do in Edge, what we know is Edge has capacity to do for us and gives us a consistent way to talk about it um, with the with the business users. But that's really that Edge is where we are looking at doing that, Steve. Right, thanks. <laughs> So a term that we might want to look at and uh, that, that could be ambiguous is disturbance. <laughs> what disturbance are we talking about? Are they all the same? Wait. Um, be, yeah, that would be a good one. Any, are there any um, questions, comments, or any, any further thoughts? That's really all I had uh, to present. I'm good unless anybody else had anything they wanted out of me. I would say, I would just ask, does, does this approach appear to offer value? I mean, do you see value in us pursuing that um, and using this type of model to collect the business information? What would that mean to you guys in your roles? No? Uh, I guess the question, the first question I would ask in response, you know, you're never supposed to answer a question with a question, but here we go, um, is when you say utilize the model, what exactly do you mean? I mean, do I think the general concept is good? Absolutely. 
Yeah, so if we had, so if we had, uh, if you could go to Edge and you could look at a business concept and you could see examples and you could see business rules that were associated with it, what would that mean for you? Well, how would you use that and if, would it be valuable? Absolutely. In the book, we call it a concept model. That's where that came from. Yeah, um, by having our business rules spelled out in detail about what they cover and what they do not cover gives us clarity between uh, like information and unlike information. So that we can, I mean, if we can define it and we can narrow it down so we don't to reduce the ambiguity, then we win no matter what, you know, we win in the data game, I guess is what I want to say. So I think part of what maybe Rochelle's getting at, at least what I think of is, you know, what's the return on investment? This is not, you know, free. It doesn't build itself. So the business has to engage and put the time into building this, not just building it, but maintaining it as the business evolves and changes. You know, I, you know, is that uh, the question? Is it is that valuable? That investment of time, you see it as valuable, or maybe you're not sure. I'm not sure myself because this is new to me. I think, in terms of communicating and working with a with an IT developer, I think there's value there to say, here's how I do my work. Now, you know, and, and help the IT person or the data person understand my work and be able to build a system that reflects my work rather than what they think I need. Um, I feel like there's value there. I can't quantify that, oh yeah, that's gonna be worth all the hours you put into it. I'm not sure, but I'm curious about if people when they hear that think, oh, my business SMEs are gonna say, I don't have time for that. Well, I thought of that right away when when you were going through it and how it would help like Mike bring in data into the IDMB and inform his models, but you said that's the way they train you in yeah. school. The same yeah, like sort it, of if, thing. if you take a grad school class on data modeling, you create those diagrams more like a conceptual data model mm -hmm. so you can help build the relationships between all the entities you're modeling out. And I didn't show the dimensional model diagram that we have um, for the use cases we built out, but essentially that same diagram just in data modeling notation. And so as a data modeler, you can interpret the different symbols by and figure out what the relationships are exactly as you're defining it in these diagrams. And the only difference being this is built in a language that the recreation person understands and you're taking it the next step of I put it into a data modeler's language yeah, exactly. and model and diagram. Yeah. And that's yeah, and that's what it would matter. Like that's you wouldn't just build the entire environment just to do it, you know, like because you yeah. can't it's like well, how would we even use it and people don't want to spend time doing things like that if there's not a purpose. So it sure. seems like if it was we could prioritize it based on what we're trying to get done, then it would be really useful. So a project we, like a we have a we have a demo, a project or an effort that we want to engage in, let's use this concept to, to be the foundation of that effort. It's my opinion, yeah. Steve, Steve has his hand up. Yeah, Steve's got his hand up. Steve. Yeah, I'm just curious. So if uh, and I so sorry if you co uh, cover this while you were presenting uh, Chris and Lauren, I dropped for a few minutes, but if we as a community collectively agree this is something we want to do or at least take a really hard look at, do we have we given any thought to where we may want to start? Is there an area where we could try this and see how it goes? If it's a complete, you know, we aren't getting the ROI or just just try it, see see what happens with it. Have we identified an area where this might make some sense to, to start? Well, in the Forest Service, we identify, you know, planning a NEPA, uh, NEPA area, but with it, I don't think, Rochelle, we've discussed. Yeah, you know, I, we've talked about this 